Mark, on a movie, a director has to know a thousand different jobs, whether it be writing, story, lighting, sound, makeup, working with actors, editing, so on and so forth. When it comes down to it, what do you think is the most important job of a director? Okay, the most important job to me is really simple, if you think about it. First of all, the director of a film is a storyteller. In fact, everybody who he's working with is there to help tell one story. So the director's primary job is to be the shepherd of that story take care of the story and tell the story as clearly, as honestly, and as authentically as possible. <coughs> I say story, not the script. The script, which we can talk about later, is a step towards getting the story told. In terms of your question, what you're asking about, in terms of the story being told, at the center of the story, the most important part of the story, are the characters. It's the characters who tell the story not the cinematography, not the production design, not all those other elements. All those other elements are a support system to the story. So the director needs to be focusing on the story and then on the characters. And the strength of the performances, the authenticity of the performances, the clarity of characters, the clarity of relationships, the clarity of the journey of each character is really crucial in order to tell the story well. That's the primary focus of a director. And if a director can't do that or loses sight of that, the story is going to start to wobble. And we've seen that a lot, stories which wobble because, simply because of performance, even though a lot of the other elements may be brilliant, like CGI and special effects and all that. All that stuff is beautiful, it's wonderful, but it's not the story. Is the story wobbling because the actors are wrong for the part? When you say, shepherding the story, where would that get lost? Where would the director, in the course of, let's say, a 14-hour day on set working with actors, lose that? Can you give some examples of what things could happen or how things could happen? Okay, you brought up two things. What could happen in a 14-hour day? And then you brought up a casting question. So there are two questions, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, if the actor is right. It, I'm going to go back to the casting first. First of all, the casting, which is really crucial, and very often we've all seen films where we feel the casting, although understandable, is not right. Doesn't feel like right. that actor is bringing me closer to the character. And many times that actor is a star or whatever, so you can understand why. <coughs> so the casting is really important that we, the audience, the goal is that we, the audience, lose sight of the actor and are only watching the character. And many times the actor, even the power of the actor, or the, the um, career of the actor, or a lot of other things can get in the way of us connecting with the character. One more thing on casting, you can cast someone who can't seem to get to the character, just nothing to do with star power. So casting is really important to find someone who can actually access that character. Now, in a 14-hour day, let's say in a 14-hour day when we're shooting a couple of scenes or one scene or whatever we're doing in that day, you ask how the director can lose sight of the shepherding of the story <coughs> very easily, very easily. And I can tell you as a director and having directed a lot of films and having worked on a lot of films, you can see it happen. It's what a friend of mine, Mark Rydell, who I worked with a lot, called the big machine. The big machine is the filmmaking process. Cameras, lights, crew, all of it, it's huge. You've been on a set, you know what it's like, it's enormous. And the director is sort of the leader, the guy that, that everybody's looking to. And what can happen is the director gets <coughs> distracted by all the challenges and everything he has to do. I'm not saying he doesn't have to do that, he has to do all that and can lose sight of what is most important. You're shooting that close-up of that actress at that moment. What's most important? The lighting? No. The background? No. The special effects? No. What's most important is that performance. I heard once on a set, a director, after they had shot a moment, turn to the script supervisor and say, did she say all the words? And the script supervisor says, yes. And he says, okay, good, moving on. His, his criteria was, did she say all the words? Not was that the performance we need? 
In other words, can the director keep their focus on the performance? Because when it comes down to the film and we see it on the screen, what do we see? The performance. The big thing that Mark Rydell told me about is you can be on the set and watch and go, that was great, that was wonderful. You can even be in dailies and watch it later and go, great, wonderful. You can see it at home later and go, huh, what happened to great and wonderful? The machine is taken away. A lot of directors get their energy from the big machine. From the fact that there's a crew and there are lights and energy, everybody goes quiet, everybody's listening. Wow, They're, they get excited by the fact that they are shooting a film. And that excitement will go away. And then you look at the shot and you go, what? I thought it was great when we did it, what happened? What happened was there's an energy around you which is now gone. So a director's job is can you shut down the big machine, can you focus your attention onto just what that actress is doing, what she's giving to you. Can you see only that? Now that's really hard. And one other aspect of this, assuming that you've been working with this actress a lot and you've rehearsed and you've discussed this intentionally, so you know what you're going for and you know what she's going for. Can you watch her in that moment, not only shut down the big machine, but can you watch her in that moment as if you've never seen her before? and you're seeing what she's doing for the first time. That's hard. It's the hardest thing a director has to do. What are two or three things that a director cannot afford to get wrong because if they do, the movie is ruined? Wow, that's a big question. Two or three things they can't get wrong. Cannot afford. Okay, uh, there's, there's one thing, one thing, Karen, that I think is really important that, and I include myself in this, that we all fall into, a trap that we all fall into. And what I call it is the trap of assumption. Okay? The trap of assumption is, let's say I have a script, and I really like it, and I'm moved by it. Okay? my assumption will be that other people will be moved by it. Somebody else will, could read it or see this film or whatever and be moved of it. I could be wrong. I'll even take a scene. I have a scene between, say, a husband and a wife and there's an argument going on and the husband's really angry at the wife for some reason and it's, to me it's clear he's angry at her because of her attitude, her impatience. Now I'm down to something very small. And my assumption is that the rest of anybody else watching it would get that. It may not be true. The problem is this. When we look at it in a script, on a, in a script, I'm just going to take one scene. I can read that scene, Karen, and I can read it, say, say it's just two pages. I can read that scene and I go, I got it. I can see what's happening, I can feel all the energy between the two characters, I can feel the conflict, I can feel the resolution, I can feel all the obstacles, everything that they're going through, I get it. Now quite honestly, those two pages, none of what I felt is there. I can tell you that right now. None of it. None of the conflict and even the characters is there. All it is is words typed on a page. No different than a novel, no than, it's just words on a page. What happens, which we all have to recognize, is when you look at a script, you project into that material what you believe is happening. You actually, anybody who reads a script can suddenly hear the characters. They can see the characters. Where is that coming from? It's not coming from the page, it's not there. There's no pictures of the characters there, there's no action there, nothing. There's no emotion there, there's no performance there, nothing. So what we do, what every human being does, is we project into those pages what we believe is happening. In other words, those pages are triggering me. Those pages that I'm reading trigger Mark, Mark's history, Mark's life experience, Mark's expectation, everything is coming from me. So I project into it. Now, Karen, you'll do the same thing. But why should I assume that your projection is the same as mine? That's the danger of assumption. I assume that you'll get it the same way I do. Not true. Maybe close? I don't know. So the trap is the trap of assumption. I assume that 
you're going to respond that way. I could see a scene and go, oh, that's so moving. And you're going, what? I don't get it. Now, my, my reaction was, it was moving. Yours was, was, was it? My assumption is you should get it. So, tr thinking that just because it works for me, it should work for everybody else. Yet, ironically, the flip side of that is also true. I, as a director, have to make the movie for me. I can't make it for anybody else. So, I have to allow a certain level of assumption to going on. I'm assuming because I made a movie that I really like that's moving to me, I have to assume that it's going to be moving to enough people that the, lots of people are going to like it. So we're trapped in the world of assumption. We're trapped in that we have to do it, but being aware that it could be a problem. Okay, so how is someone aware of their own assumptions? So let's suppose you think these two pages of very moving dialogue between two characters is just heart-wrenching because you see the world that way or that scene. Mm -hmm. But how are you bouncing that off someone else or uh, I don't know if I'm making yeah, yeah, myself clear. Yeah, let's, let's, well, yeah, I think so and I think I have an answer for it. Um, let's stay with this one scene because sometimes just looking at one scene because a, a movie is, you don't make a whole movie as you know, you make these all these little scenes and you put it together it becomes a movie. So let's, and you, you have to be very focused, very myopic about that scene. So let's say we have a scene between a husband and wife. And getting back to you, how do I deal with my assumptions? I'll tell you, one of the biggest assumptions I as a director can have, any director will have, every director will have. I read the scene, I know how it should play. I as the director know how this scene should play, should. Now, I'm the director, so I get to decide. I get to decide how I want the actress to play the mother and how I want the actor to play the father. Now, this is what a lot of actors to do. And I could, a lot of directors will do. I'm sorry, that's what a lot of directors will do. And I can tell you right now, because working with a lot of directors, I'll say to a director who says, this is how it should go. And I said, how do you know? Well, that's, that's clearly the way it should play. I said, how do you know? And I'll talk to them about projection. So there's that assumption. Now we're going to mix with that something else, which makes it even more difficult. You have the two actors. Now those two actors read the scene, and they're making assumptions. The actress will say, oh, I, I, I know how to play this. The actor will say, oh, yeah, I know how to play him. Now we have three people who have different points of view on how it should play. And I can tell you right now, the director, me, and those two actors, right, we're all wrong. We are all wrong wrong. We are right about our assumptions. We are right about our opinion. But we are wrong. Our opinion actually does not matter. All three of us. The only opinion that matters is the opinion of the characters. The character, the husband and wife, they know. And we're trying to tell them how they should behave. The actors are trying to tell them how to behave by controlling them. I'm trying to tell the actors how to control the characters, how to portray the characters. If I can get to the character, get to the truth of the character, my assumption may be blown right out of the water. And the actors may be too, or may not, I don't know. But my job as the director is to serve the characters. That's getting back to what your question was before, serve the story. Not my version of the story, their version of the story. I want to get to the truth of who they are. I want to get to the truth of these characters that the writer created, that the writer is also making assumptions about. And the writer may even tell me, oh, it should go this way. And I said, well, I don't know if you know either. Let's get to the character. And this gets down to the interrogation process, which is talking to the character. I want to know from the character what they want, what they think, what they feel. Now, one thing that's very important, which may have been in the DVD I gave you, it probably is, but one thing that's very important, and this is a concept that is, is so, to me, is so clear and so obvious, but nobody talks about it. But as soon as I bring it up, people go, oh yeah. The characters in your movie, the characters in this scene, these two people, this husband and wife, whoever they might be, 
are not in a movie. They're not. They're two people who are in their life. They're in a moment in their life, which happens to be this scene, trying to achieve whatever they're trying to achieve. They're just two people. They're not in a movie. They don't, they do not have a script. And we are trying to present them as authentically as we can to a viewer. Well, in order to do that, we need to honor them. Not my point of view, necessarily. Not the actor's point of view, necessarily. But them. Let's, let's present them as authentically as we can. I have learned so much about characters and story by talking to the characters. By, in a way, and I mean this seriously, dismissing a little bit what the writer says, what the actors say, and even what I think. And I go and I talk to the characters and I am sometimes so educated and enlightened about who these people are. I go, they're the ones I'm here to serve. They're the ones that the writer is here to serve. That the, We're all there in service of characters. So let's talk to them. Now the interrogation process, which we can talk about later, is a way to get to them and get us, the writer, the director, and the actors, out of the way. Many times, getting to the truth of the story, the actors, the writers, and the, and the director are the biggest obstacle. We are in the way of what we are trying to achieve. Let's go back to the word assumption and the filter that the director sees this story from. How much does a director really have to check their own worldview? Their own worldview? Mm -hmm. For the filter that they see the yeah. world through, which has years of good things, bad things, yeah. dramas, abandonment, happiness, yeah. praise. How much do they really have to know themselves to see, am I projecting this worldview, which may not be correct, onto every story? Okay. Couple, you know, first of all, how much do they know themselves? Yeah, and how important is first, that? First of all, really important to know themselves. Um, I'm not, it's really important to know themselves. I'm sort of struggling a little bit with how much do they have to check themselves. But let's go back to know themselves. I think they really have to know themselves a lot. Um, know who they are. I think the, the more you know who you are, the know, more you know about your assumptions, your prejudice, prejudices, your um, view of life and the world because of your life experiences and how you see things through different filters. The more you know that, the better director you're going to be. The, 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 uh, the more um, able you may be to get out of the way. Your job is to get out of the way, out of the story, and not try to impose something. Um, on a story or on characters. There's a um, process of the Travis Technique, which I don't know if you and I have talked about much at all, uh, called Write Your Life, which is, and it's, it's a very important part of the whole process, which is storytelling. And it's storytelling, not so much writing, even though it's called Write Your Life, but it's autobiographical storytelling, taking a, an event in your life and telling one event in your life. Maybe it only takes three, four, five minutes to tell this event. The question is, when you're telling an event in your life, can you tell it honestly? If you're telling something that happened to you, this is what I love about this workshop and this way of working, that event is already written. There's nothing to write. It happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this is the event that happened. Done. So there's nothing to create. What, the, what your challenge is, is how do I tell this story? How do I tell this story openly and honestly? Second question is, do you know yourself well enough? You are the protagonist of that event. How well do you know yourself? And how well are you willing to reveal yourself? in all your flaws and all your courage and all your trepidations, expectations, whatever was going on with you in that event. Can you really, do you really understand it? And can you, can you reveal it in the story, knowing that in that event that you're going to tell, that little three-minute event, your journey through that three-minute story 
is the only thing that the story is about. What happened around you, let's say it was a birthday party that you went to or something like that and some strange things happened, all those things that happened around you and that impacted you, that's not the story. The story is how you felt, how you reacted, what you thought, what you were feeling, what you were desiring, what you were expecting. That's the story and that's the story of any character in any movie. So going through Write Your Life, can you even do that? How well do you know yourself? And the better you know yourself and can see how you operate in any moment, the better you're going to be able to see other characters, the better you're going to be able to work with actors. So this whole thing of knowing yourself is crucial and this is why we teach Write Your Life to so many writers, directors and actors so that they can start from a point of self-awareness and self-revelation before going into writing the next script, before that, taking that next role, before directing that next movie. If you know yourself, you say, I now understand how I operate as a human being. You'll understand every character you work with so much better. So that, that is crucial. And then getting back to your question about imposing your own worldview on it, you will be less likely to do that because you'll be more likely to want to honor the view of the characters. And there's one other aspect of this too is that when you read a script and it impacts you, and I'm assuming you have this script that you've read that you want to make into a movie and you've been really so moved by it you say, I want to make this. My first question to you, the director would be, great. <coughs> Why do you want to make this, all, the, all that, but what do you want to say? What do you want to do? The best answer to that is, I want to create this as a movie, this story as a movie, so that viewers will have the reaction I had to it. Not so I can push this message on them. I was so moved by this. I was so moved by these characters. I was touched. I was brought to tears and laughter. And I went on an emotional journey as I was reading this. I want to afford an audience, a viewer and audience, the same experience, knowing that for each member of the audience, it'll be different. It won't be exactly the same as mine. So write your life. Is that part of the Travis technique? Yes. It's a part. There are three uh, main elements of the Travis Technique. One is Write Your Life, which is the autobiographical storytelling, which is besides um, telling your own personal stories, it's all the basics of storytelling, all the structural aspects of, of telling any kind of story. So it really grounds you in storytelling. And one thing that's important about it is it's not a writing class per se. It's a storytelling. Can you tell the story? Directors, writers, and actors need to learn how to tell stories, not just write them. Writing comes next. Can I actually sit down and tell you a story? Take three minutes and tell you a story. By in <clears throat> and then can I examine my own character within the story, know my own character, and can I consciously take you on a journey through that little three-minute story? <clears throat> the when you tell an autobiographical story, the goal is, if I were to tell you an autobiographical story right now, Karen, the goal, my goal would be I'm going to tell, take you through an event and it'll take me three to five minutes to tell you and my goal is to have you experience while you're listening to the story exact, exactly what I experienced as I lived it without having to tell you, oh, and then that point I was really sad and all that. I don't have to fill that all in. I will tell the story in such a way that you get it immediately. Now that's the power of storytelling, whether it's verbal or cinema or a play or even a novel to be able to do that. So that's what Write Your Life is about. It's, it's a very powerful t um, experience. And this is why a lot of people uh, take it over and over and over again. They keep coming back and take it again, take it again. It's like going back to the gym and working out all those muscles of storytelling. Again, the basics. The other two aspects of uh, the Travis Technique, the next one is the interrogation process, which you know about a little bit, which is the directorial technique of working with actors to access the characters. <coughs> it's a process of not directing the actors but actually accessing the characters, talking to the characters and how to stimulate the characters 
with the understanding that when you cast somebody in a movie, basically, from my point of view, when I cast somebody, I'm saying to that actor, the ca character I want you to play exists already. And I will tell the actors this. The character exists already inside you. You do not need to create the character. You do not need to develop the character. You don't need to do anything <coughs> except that some one thing that you have to do, which is very, very hard to do. It's almost impossible. You have to get out of the way and let the character come out because the character is inside you. And the problem is you're in the way, but I can help you. Now, that's the interrogation process, which helps the actor actually remove themselves from a process and allow the character to emerge. And we can talk more about that. The third part of the Travis technique is the power of staging. And this all has to do with a very simple concept that is so powerful that we all deal with every moment of our lives. We all move in the world <coughs> in pretty much the same way, all of us. We all move around the world avoiding conflict, seeking comfort, even as we set up to shoot this. That's what we did. We, we all move in relationship to the environment and to other people and even the way we sit and what chair we want. We all move that way. Now, this is how we, 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 move, we move in life in response to all the elements around us. The power of staging is we're creating something artificial so I can stage a scene in such a way, which I could demonstrate, I could stage a scene in such a way that how I move the actors in relationship to each other, in relationship to the environment, whatever it is, and even in terms of their own body language, I can move them and actually stimulate within every actor the emotion I need for the character at that moment whether it's comfort, discomfort, anger, rage, abandonment, whatever it is, I can move them in such a way that that gets triggered in the actor. And the actor now does not have to create that feeling. The actor has to now struggle with that feeling. As we move through life, all of us, <coughs> we're impacted and we have emotional reactions to things. We, get, we feel sad, we feel happy, we feel abandoned, we feel uncomfortable, whatever. It is. We have emotional reactions. We don't go through life trying to create emotions. I don't know of anybody who's ever done that. I think I'm going to be happy in the next second and I'm just, you know, we don't do that. We would like to have these, but we have these emotional reactions. So my goal, and it's very successful working with staging, is I can trigger emotions inside the actor that are appropriate for the character. And now, as the character, they have to struggle with that emotion, what to do with it. And now it's authentic. You're not watching an actor create an emotion or pretend to have an emotion. You're watching, watching an actual person struggling with or embracing whatever they're doing, dealing with genuine emotions. And that's the power of staging. And the other aspect of that is when it's working well, the audience sees it immediately. The audience will react emotionally too. So I'm actually triggering emotions in the audience simultaneously as I'm doing it with the act. So I, be, again, getting back to what we were talking about before, because of projection. Because when we watch a scene, when we watch a movie, we watch a play, we watch anything, even if we watch people in life, we project ourselves into them. And we see two people arguing at another table. We, oh, oh he's, he's so uncomfortable. Well, why are you reacting that way? Because you're saying, if I was there, this is how I would be feeling. So through staging, I can trigger emotions in the audience and get to help the audience identify more deeply with the characters. So those are the three elements. So when you're doing a weekend seminar, are you beginning with the writing portion and then working in interrogation and then doing the staging or no? Well, it, <laughs> Not on a weekend. Okay, not a weekend. Okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's a great question. Um, and it's something that Elsha and I struggle with all the time for every workshop we put together. Um, our ideal situation, yeah, we would deal with all of it. But then it's going to take days or weeks because each one is so massive. So what we have is we have a weekend workshop that we do frequently, which is just called Write Your Life. So you can learn that. Then we have other weekend workshops that we've done or longer, which are on, on the interrogation process. The last time we did that, it was actually longer. It was 10 days. 
just for directors just to learn the interrogation process. Um, or we'll include the interrogation process and staging together. So it, it's the Travis technique is really an umbrella for a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, and we have found if we try to teach too much in a short, short period of time, then we're skimming over the surface. And we like to do workshops where you can really plunge yourself into one technique or one aspect of it to really uh, benefit from digging that deep into that process. One last question and then we'll move on. In terms of the writing your life portion, what are some things that you see get in the way of people telling an authentic version of a scene from their life? I mean, do people tend to paint too rosy of a picture of a scene that's really from their own life? Or the opposite, because people tend to sometimes embellish memories that aren't there. Too traumatic yeah. and you can kind of sense that it's not authentic. Yeah. Well, all, yeah, all of that ha can happen, and there's more that can happen. First of all, we have to look at someone. I mean, next time, wherever you are, <laughs> you and David are someplace listening to friends tell a story, just listen and ask yourself seriously, and this is not critical at all, why are they telling the story? Why is she telling this story? Why is he telling this story? You know, there, there's an agenda. There's a reason. Now, maybe they're telling the story to to make a point clear that they were trying to make earlier and they're using the story to tell it. Fine. Maybe they're telling the story for self-aggrandizement. Maybe they're telling it for they want sympathy or pity. Uh, who knows? There's, a, there's, a, there's always a reason for telling the story. And since it's an autobiographical story, lots of times the reason to tell the story is for you. I want to tell the story so you understand something about me. So I'm doing it for me. I'm trying to, to elicit something out of you. What we do in Write Your Life is say, can you tell the story and think of the story as a gift? I want to give you a gift. The gift is the experience you're going to go through hearing the story. It has nothing to do with me in a way, even though it's my story. Because when we make a film or we tell a story, that's a gift to the world. I don't want, I make a movie, I don't want people to be thinking about me, the director. Not at all. I want them involved in the story. The gift and the gift of the story, whether it's told or it's a film, the gift of the story is twofold. One is what the viewer or listener is experiencing as the story is being unfo unfolding. That's one gift. Those two hours in, in the movie or just five minutes listening to the story, that's one gift. The other gift, which is even bigger in a way, is the legacy of the story. We've all seen movies that we will never forget. We've all seen movies that have changed our lives in certain ways and sometimes we're not even aware of it until years later. We go, oh, that, wow, it's when I saw that movie, something shift. That's the power of what we're doing. And that's also the gift of storytelling, that it can last forever. And again, it's not about the storyteller. So getting back to your question, what are the traps they can fall into is, are you doing this so are you telling the story so that the listener will see you in a different way? Well, that then it's all about you. Are you doing this for self-aggrandizement or um, something else? And are you willing, this is a big question, right, Shalev, are you willing to tell the story and reveal really how vulnerable you were, how stupid you were, how arrogant you were, which means how human you were at that time? Can you do that? And that's not asking for pity. In other words, how honest can you be? So what we focus on in The Right Your Life, can you tell it honestly? Get the agenda out of the way. Your agenda now is be honest. And that's what a lot of people struggle with. They struggle, first of all, looking at what was really going on. And when they start to see it, it gets a little shaky. And then reveal it. It gets even shakier. And I say, well, that's the business we're in. We're storytellers. And we don't tell stories for people to change their opinion about us. We actually still tell stories so people can have an experience that may shift something within them and maybe even change their opinion about themselves, not about us. We have to tell these stories honestly, authentically. 
we, the director, writer, and actors, actually have to, this is really ironic, because we are the primary, that's this is the, what I call the golden triangle, director, actors, and writers. That's the golden triangle that's telling the story. The rest of it is a support system. We, as that golden triangle, the primary triangle of telling stories, have to get out of the way. We have to remove ourselves from the very thing we're doing, which is very hard. It's not about the writer, it's not about the director, and it's certainly not about the actors. It's about the characters. We have to get out of the way and serve the story and serve the characters, and that's hard. Mark, I believe you said that every director must also be a writer. So does that mean that every director should rewrite, in some sense, the screenplay of the movie that they're directing? Oh, what a great question. But there are two questions. <laughs> You always hit me with two questions. <laughs> um, first of all, every director, I'm going to do, every director should be a writer. Yes, every director should write. Whether they write well or not is not important. I think every director should understand the writing process. Um, that's why we do Write Your Life. But also the screenwriting process, which is different. That, and to at least understand and appreciate the challenges of trying to get a story into what I call, you know, the two-hour haiku. You know, it's like <laughs> reducing it down to the story to those elements. We can talk about that later. <clears throat> but in terms of the director rewriting, no. Rewriting the script. A director gets a script. It's not the director's job to rewrite. It is the director's job to work with the writer. I'm a very passionate protector of the writer. And I think if the writer has brought a script to a point where a director is interested in doing it, then they should keep working with the writer. I don't understand this getting rid of writers or bringing in other people to rewrite. I do understand uh, the collaboration of a director and writer working together and then eventually with the actors and everybody else uh, staying involved. When I've done films, the writer stays all the way through the whole making of the film, all the way through production and post-production. They are part of the storytelling team. I have my job, they have their job. I like having the writer on the set. I'm shooting something. There was uh, one film I was doing which we were having trouble with a scene. I remember this. And the, the two writers were there. There was a writing team. And we couldn't get it to work. And I told them, I said, I'm going to improvise the scene. Hold on. And they went, okay. And I went back to the actors and I took them through a process, quick process, and then we started to improvise the scene. And I remember the writers going, yes, you got it. Now, the fact that the writers said, yes, that's where we're going, I felt great. It wasn't me rewriting the scene. It wasn't even the actors rewriting the scene. The, the, the writers were there. I'm trying to serve their initial vision of the film combined with mine, combined with the actors, trying to reach the characters. So I, I, don't, um, I don't like the idea, although it happens a lot in Europe, which you may know, um, and I've run, I have a lot of friends because I teach a lot in Europe, especially in Germany, and a lot of friends who are very, very successful writers there, and it's a constant problem. They will write a script, say for television, and the director comes on and the director does a rewrite. The first thing they do is they rewrite it. <coughs> um, I was, um, at one point, I've directed a little bit in Germany, and I was at one point was going to direct something, and the production company said, sent me the script. They said, okay, and they said, when are we going to get your director's script? And I said, what do you mean? And I'm reading the script, I said, yes, I want to do this. Well, when are you going to, I said, what do you mean the director's script? What they meant was, we expect you to rewrite it. Now, so this was the producers expecting the director to rewrite the script that they had bought and they wanted to produce. And I said, no, I'm not going to rewrite it. I'm going to work with the writer. So I don't um, encourage directors to think they have to rewrite it. I've seen too many times, especially in, in Europe, directors rewriting and reworking a script and it was really clear what they were doing unconsciously, I think, or maybe consciously, they were creating a script that they knew how to direct. And by doing that, they reduced it or shifted it from the initial intention, rather than trying to serve the script that was there initially. They altered it to something that they could handle. 
And then the story lost its essence because yeah, it lost its okay. lost. This is what this one very um, important project which a friend of mine had written, and she had a powerful script, and it was changed so dramatically into the style of film that the director felt comfortable in doing. He had been hired to do a film that he wasn't really comfortable with, so he changed it into something, that, and it changed totally. It lost to me the essence of what was there originally. It turned out fine at the end, but it was a whole different, it's a different story. It wasn't what was there originally. What is the most critical thing that a director should do when reading and reviewing a script? Okay, good question. And this is one of the hardest things to do. And I can tell you, as a director, it's really, really difficult. You get a script, you're starting to read it, and <clears throat> we're assuming before you start reading, it's something that you're being asked to consider to direct or along those lines. This may be something you're going to work on. <clears throat> or not, but let's assume that you are. The most difficult thing to do while reading it is to not direct it. Now I can tell you as a director, I start reading something and I see directorial problems immediately or directorial opportunities immediately and I go, oh, wow, I know who I could cast in that role or I know where we could shoot. Uh, suddenly my mind is directing. My mind is figuring out how to get this thing that I'm reading, which I haven't finished reading yet, up onto the screen. And I haven't given the story a chance to impact me. I have taken a side street. The hardest thing to do is sit down. Can I sit down with this story, which happens to be a script, but it's a story in script form, and can I just read it and emotionally respond to it? Just respond. Like we all do when we go to see a movie, hopefully. We sit down and just respond. It's going to be my first and only time I get to do this without knowing the story. So my response the first time through is really crucial. So what I suggest to a lot of directors to do, and this is in one of my books, um, directing feature films, it's a thing I call the script wash. Can you sit down with a script, take a script, nothing written in it except the script itself, no, none of your notes, read it, and as you're reading it and as you're responding it, can you note what your response is? Not your directing eye, your reader eye, your audience eye. When you're moved, when you feel sad, when you feel confused, when you feel intrigued, wow, what's going to happen to him? Ooh, this is an interesting, oh, I wasn't expecting that. In other words, can you note, and I'm seriously, I'm mean it seriously, write it in, write in there what you're thinking and feeling as you're going through the script, as you're responding to the characters, as you're responding to the events. Even, this doesn't make sense, I don't understand why they're doing this, and maybe three pages later, oh, I get it. That's a response. That's an audience's response to the story. Can you do that? You need to do that because basically in the making of the film, that's what you're expecting the audience to do. You have to create something that they're going to do that. And this, your emotional journey through the film is sort of a guide for where you want to do it. Actually, what you want, as, since you can only make the film for one person, you, you want to create something on the screen that now does the same thing to you now as that script did the first time you read it. That's your goal. It sounds like you're meditating on the script. You know there's a yeah. term monkey mind in meditation. Yes. So it sounds almost like the monkey mind is the director's voice yes. in your in your ears. Yes. And you've got to get rid of that. Yes. You have to. And this also applies to actors, producers, anybody else. Everybody starts shifting into their role. Actors will read it and go, oh, I could do that. Oh, well, I don't know how I would do it. Suddenly, as an actor, you're not giving the, the story a chance to impact you. You're not giving those characters a chance. You're getting, you are getting in the way. So you're, you're right, it's sort of meditative, shutting up the monkey mind, shutting down the director, actor, producer, writer, voice in your head, and just allowing, allow yourself, like a meditation, allowing yourself to just respond to what's coming to you. Can you do that? It's really, really hard. 
I would imagine it would almost behoove someone to not be at home, it sounds like, to read something in another setting because they'd be too distracted. Is that something you advise? Or to get out of their own way, but if you're at home and then you see, oh, the cat's water needs changing mm -hmm. or different, it, you're not going to be in the story. Possibly, yeah. Okay. I think that's a great idea. I think as an individual, you have to say, where can I, under what circumstances can I experience this script as purely as possible? Okay. Now I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one way. Yeah. This is really so, sound weird, but it can work. Have somebody read it to you. And now you're not reading. Now you're listening. Now you're hearing a story told. Now, that may work better for you. I mean, if I said to Elsha, if I said, Elsha, can you just read this scene to me? Now I'm hearing it. I'm, I just want to get it. I want it to come at me in a different way. And so do you have a list of, let's say, emotional words that you want to jot down so that you're getting out of the director, a.k.a. monkey mind, and jotting down the emotional language? It's sort of... I'm sort of, I don't know if they're emotional words. There's a shorthand that I have when I read a script um, that I understand. Um, I can tell you one, one thing. If I'm reading and something doesn't make sense, one word will do it. I write in, really? With a question mark. <laughs> I go, really? You're going to go, that, that's what's going to, no, that's, so that, that's, that's me tracking where my mind, so next time I'm reading through, I, and I, I go, I can see right there I had that question. So right there I had confusion or disconnection or disassociation. Not, I'm not saying this is good or bad. That's just what I did. What I did. Now someone else may not. Or I may read it again and go, oh, yeah, I can see why I did that. But now I can see it's not a problem. Whatever. I'm, I'm, I may have a different relationship to it. Another way to do it, let's say I read a script and Elsha hasn't read it. And um, <clears throat> I may say, let me tell you the story. Now I'm going to tell her, I'm not going to read it to her, I will tell her the story. In fact, we did this the other day, I started to tell her this. Now in my telling of the story, now I'm in a storytelling mode and I'm trying to, I'm focusing on taking her on a journey through it. I'm not really directing yet, and I'm getting her response. So that's, that's another relationship, again, back to the story. I'm, I'm not in the process of directing at all. I'm trying to stay as close to the story, to understand. And I think that the most difficult thing we have is I have a script. My job eventually, I can't do it on the first reading, my job eventually is to understand where the writer was coming from what the writer was intending to do. And I really can't get that to that without talking to the writer eventually. But if prior to that, with the script wash, I have to establish my relationship to the story, my fascination for it, or my, what I'm intrigued with, what I'm confused about. I have to get my relationship in place and then go to the writer and then start to understand where he or she was coming from, even why she wrote the story what she was trying to say, what she wanted to say, why this character, why is this woman the protagonist? Oh, I see. Well, that's what, I, in other words, I have to get back to their source, not just the script. Again, this gets back to assumption we were talking about before. I can follow into the trap of assuming this is what she was trying to do. I can't tell you the number of times I've read a script and it's very clear, I can make an assumption. I think I know what the, the writer is trying to do here what the writer's trying, the story they're trying to tell. And I meet and talk with the writer. I was so wrong. I was so wrong. Now, they, did they tell the story that they wanted to? No, not at all. Is the story they wanted to tell interesting? Absolutely. Did I miss it? I totally missed it. But let's go back to the source. That's the story you want to tell? Okay, there was a lot of things in here that are off track. The story they want to tell is way more important than the story they have told. And we're trying to bring those two together. So that's the, that's the danger of assumption. And if I start directing in my mind before I've even had that conversation, I'm off down on a track that eventually the writer's going to say, no, no, that's not what I wanted. And the reason I made a mistake is I didn't check to see really where the writer was coming from. So you do the script wash. You, you read it for a sort of emotional effect. 
you talk to the writer, and then at what point do you then turn on the director's mind and say, okay, now I'm reading the script with an intentional director's mind turned on? I would say, first of all, um, the director's mind sort of starts to seep in pretty early. And as I said before, it's hard to keep it quiet because that director mind wants to direct. It's a very eager little puppy in there going, <laughs> we have a script, we have a story, let's make it. Um, <clears throat> but dur during the, the process of working with the writer, the director's mind is working. Uh, it's working a lot because I can hear from the writer what he or she is trying to do, the story they're trying to tell, and my director m mind is now thinking, okay, how can I facilitate that? Um, or what's in the way of that? Or how could we explain that? Or does this mean we need another scene? Now I'm sort of writing a little bit, but I'm not writing. And Or I can hear what the d writer wants, and I go, okay, that's a great idea. I have no idea how to get that on the screen. It's a great idea, but that just doesn't seem feasible to do that. So now I have to talk to the writer and actually say that. Now the director mind is working because the director down here, down the the stream is saying, we've got a problem trying to make this. Let's see if we can solve that here with the writer. So the director's mind is working rather soon. Once we get to a script that um, I feel is very strong, I'm confident about it, although it's not the final draft. As you probably know, the final draft of the script is when the picture is locked at the end <laughs> because the script is always shifting because it's an organic entity. Um, but once we get to, to the point where we think we can go into production to really consider what the producers were going into production. Now the director's mind is really working a lot. And now it has to start to take over. Because now the directorial process is moving forward. Now I'm thinking about, thinking more about, even though I've thought about it before, I'm thinking about casting and I'm thinking about locations and elements and the team that I want to put together to help tell this story. But I have to make sure that I have a script that is the strongest I believe we can do. By we, I mean myself, the writer, producers, whoever else is involved at that time. And it could be a lot of people that they're all that are all involved. That we've got the best we can do, knowing it's going to change, and believing that the change will only be for the better, whatever it is. Then, then I can start to take over this as the director and start making demands, and and influencing it from a director's point of view. Let's assume there's a heart and soul for every screenplay, and if that's the case, how does a director find that? The heart and soul of the screenplay. Um, I would say, yeah, there is a heart and soul for the story. And hopefully it's in the screenplay. <laughs> the, and the re there's a reason I make that distinction is because many times there's a very strong story in the screenplay which is screenplay, which is basically a step in a process of bringing it to a film. The screenplay hasn't really captured that. So let's, but the story, that there's a heart and a soul in the story. And that, I think, in discussion with the writer or writers, whoever they are, um, that's the first thing you've got to find. And it's like Elsha and I had a consultation just yesterday on a script and with the writers and what we were looking for was just what you're talking about. That What's the heart and soul of this? It's a really interesting screenplay. It's a thriller, action invention thriller. But what is at the heart, soul of it that the um, audience can grab onto and identify with? My feeling is the audience doesn't really want to watch a big action adventure film. But they want, I mean, they'll watch it, be thrilled to watch it, one that's well done, but they want to connect with the people and what the people's journey is and what the people's struggles are and what the people's epiphanies are or disappointments are and the transformation of characters. That's what they want to, they want to connect with the aspect of that story that relates to their own lives, which may be very subtle or may be very, very powerful, but we have to identify that. So talking with these, these two, um, writers yesterday, that was the goal is to find that and then once we can identify that with the writers, then we can, all of us can ask each other, is it in the script? Is it clear in the script that that's what it is? But first of all, you've got to figure out what it is. And that's why many times looking at a script, you can feel it's not there. But rather than trying to 
cover it up or pretend it's there or assume that it's there or just insert something there, go back to the writers. Go back to the people who had the original idea and find out what that is and then try to identify that. And that is actually for a director. That's what's going to guide you through the entire rest of the process. That's what the movie is all about. This movie is all about um, this character who is fighting these struggles, who is fighting these aspects of himself and the world around him and his family or his work or what, whatever he's fighting. And that what gets revealed through that process is what this man or this woman is going through that we can identify with. So you got to get that early. Then the process of the rewrites or re-examining the script is how can we get that in? How can we make that clear to the audience? Also clear to the actors, really important, so the actors can see it, the actors who are playing these parts can attach themselves to that. So if it's not clear, um, is it because we're not having an emotional response to it or we're not having the emotional response that the writer intended us to have? Well, probably both. We're not having an emotional response or the one that's intended or the one that's assumed by the writer. Okay. This, this, is, this is a danger of writing. This is getting back to that assumption thing we were talking about before, which we deal a lot with. I'm going to go back to write your life. I'm telling you a story about a traumatic experience I had. That's, for instance, say, personal experience. And I'm going to assume that if I tell you everything that happened, you're going to have the same emotional reaction I did. That's a huge assumption. You may not. A writer can write a script. It may be true, it may be personal, it may be totally fiction. But the writer writing that script and all those characters is having an emotional experience as he or she is creating it. With these characters, how they're relating to each other, all the t twists and turns in the story, and they're going, oh, that's great, that's great, assuming that anybody else reading it will be having the same reaction. That may not be true. So that the assumption of the writer is a problem, can be a problem. And the best way to deal with that is really simple. You tell the writer, there's your problem. You wrote that scene and you're very moved by it. I read the scene, I don't get it. Okay, what you're intending is great. I'm not getting it and other people are not, you're assuming they were getting it because you are so identified with those characters in that situation. Okay, not a problem. Let's figure out how we can make it clearer to the audience so the audience does get it. And that's my job as a director. That's my job as a directing consultant or a writing consultant is to help writers get to that point where the scene is clearer. Now, <clears throat> one thing which we don't need to talk a lot about, but one thing is a script, speaking of script and writer, a script initially, in order to get made into a movie, has to engage the reader. And as you know, the reader very often is not the person who's going to produce it. The reader is somebody down the line in some production company, whatever it does. You, in other words, that script by itself, by its little self, those 120 pages has to impact that reader. So the first thing is, let's make sure the reader gets it. The reader who just picks up another script and starts reading gets it. That's really crucial. So forget me, the director, and forget all the other people. We've got we to make sure that the script is strong enough that that works. And if it's not doing that, then it's not going to get made. And the writer can deal with his, his or her frustration. Like, why can't they get it? Say, Don't go there. Don't go, why can't they get it? Let's go back to how could, and this is what a lot of people like Michael Haig and Chris Vogel and all those people teach screenwriting, work with writers on. It's not, lots of times it's not about what the story is, it's about how do you craft these scenes and characters in a certain way that the writer will get it and eventually all the other people who are going to work on it. So then the writer needs to know their assumptions and their um, lenses that they see the world through as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. That's why a lot of writers take Write Your Life, to start to see the, you're right, the, those lenses as you talk about, those filters that you're looking and the assumption is a filter. I'm looking through that, well, you know, I, I had this, um, I'm just going to make this up, I had this bout with cancer and I fought off cancer and it took, you know, robbed me of a year of my life but now I'm a cancer survivor and I could tell you about it and you should f you feel horrified by what happened because I did and frightened. And someone could tell me that and I go, okay. 
It's not, it's not going to impact me the way you think it is, only because you, as you tell it, re, re-experience everything you went through. So that filter of assumption, that filter of assumption of a writer, even writing fiction, I created this great moment in the scene and nobody gets it. Well, then we have to keep working on it. I understand what you're going for. I understand what you want them to get. You haven't crafted it in a way for them to get it. So it's also understanding, not only from a writer's point of view, not only understanding their layer uh, or barrier of assumption. And because every screenwriter, I think this is really true, finishes a screenplay, thinks it's brilliant. <laughs> Hopefully they do. Why otherwise why do it? And that's an assumption too. But also they have to realize that every reader has barriers against certain things that you have to plow through, you have to break through, you have to surprise them, you have to sort of find your way around the barriers and the obstacles that the reader has within themselves. So yes, you have to understand yourself and you have to understand, you can't say, why don't you get that? You have to understand that they don't get it for a reason. What's the biggest mistake a filmmaker can make before day one on a movie set? Before day one, day one of shooting. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. Let me let me think on that for a second. The biggest mistake, aside from not showing up. Well, <laughs> before <laughs> before, but you you narrowed it down to before day one. In other words, before they go into production. Something maybe they overlooked, something they sort of micromanaged that shouldn't have been micromanaged. I don't know. I'm, I'm I don't know. And in, in terms of overlooking something or micromanaging, now we're down to details, and, and it could be there could be a lot of things. But I think one of the biggest mistakes a director can make, and one that I've made frequently, way too often, <coughs> is assuming that I know what I want. Assuming, and that I'm talking about for the whole movie, and every scene, every moment, really convinced I know exactly what I want. And now I do know what I want, but what I'm talking about is the assumption that that is that is what eventually I will want in the film. In other words, closing my mind to something beyond that, other than that. I think the biggest thing a director has to do is keep their mind open to the f- to possibilities beyond what they've imagined, even no matter how much they've rehearsed it, no matter how much they've worked on the script, no matter how, all the preparation that they're doing as they're going into production, keep your mind open. One thing that's very important in the whole filmmaking process, and I'm going to talk about now just working with actors for a second, I'm going to go way back. Actors who come in and for an audition, okay, are actors looking for a job, wanting a job, needing a job, whatever. Actors, once they're cast, your actors that are cast, and now they're cast, and but you haven't hit production yet, are now a different breed of animal, totally. They are actors who have a job. And so they and you'll notice that. It's really interesting after you've cast the movie and then you're bringing the actors together, maybe for the first reading, they are totally different. They're not the, the same sort of needy, compliant, careful people. They're a little arrogant. They're a little full of themselves. Or they're a little, fr- they've changed. Everyone has changed in a slightly different way. They're not quite the same people. And it can be sort of horrifying like, did I get the right people here? Because they're different now. Okay, so now you're in the rehearsal process and all that, and you're, and you're going through that, and you're aiming, going, you're in pre-production, and you're going towards production, okay? And you're rehearsing whatever you're doing, which we can talk about later. Then you hit production. They change again. Because <laughs> now it's the person who walks on the set, and they know today is the day we're shooting that scene. They are under enormous pressure. So there are three different stages. So <clears throat> as you go into production, getting back to your question, be aware that these people are shifting. They're different now. They may be more problematic. They may be more compliant. They may be more irritating. They may be more charming. Who knows what they're going to be? But they're human. And they're under enormous pressure now. So they will try to shift to their places of comfort and all that. So, but again, getting back to your question, 
<coughs> about the mistakes you can make. Keep your mind open. These people, these actors under enormous pressure now, who you've worked with, however much you've worked with them, who knows what they're going to come up with? Who knows how that scene that you just rehearsed three weeks ago that you thought was so wonderful in the rehearsal room and now you're going to shoot it, it's going to shift, it's going to change because the actors have changed. Keep your mind open. Ideally, and this goes back to the rehearsal process and all that which we haven't talked about, but ideally if you've been rehearsing deeply enough and profoundly enough, ideally those actors are going to go even deeper on you because of the pressure. They will go deeper into the character and they will start revealing stuff to you that you had probably never imagined. Don't try to make the movie in production that you were thought you were making in pre-production. It's going to shift. It's going to change. Ideally, if the process that you've been going through of working on the film <coughs> has been to go for the depth of characters, it's going to get deeper. It's going to get better. But you have to be flexible. And an actor can show up and suddenly they're doing that scene in a way you never imagined. Now you have a problem. Not because they're doing it different. What do you do? Do you try to get them back to what you had before? Or do you let them go the way they're going? Okay, this is, in other words, don't assume that you have to try to keep it to what you uh, were thinking before. There's a um, chapter or section of my book and production that I call The Nightly Reconsideration Process, which is very simply this. <coughs> you read the script, you imagine a movie. You cast it and all that, now you're in pre-production and you're working on rehearsal and putting together all the elements and the movie in your imagination is getting more detailed. But it's shifting. It's shifting from what it was when you first read it. Now it's coming into some kind of perceived reality, although it's not really there yet. Now you're in production and as you start production, the entire movie is in your head to some degree. You, you can see it. You can feel it. You know what you're going for. You shoot the first scene. I can guarantee you that scene will not turn out the way you thought it was going to. In fact, I can guarantee you for every scene you do, it won't turn out exactly the way you thought. But the nightly reconsideration process is on that first day, say you shoot two scenes, one scene, two scenes, suddenly you have shot some material that is going to be in your movie. That scene has now been defined by what you shot, the possibilities, the range of it. It's been limited actually down to what you shot. It hasn't been expanded, it's been limited. And now because that exists, you, it's automatically you start reconsidering the entire movie. Well, if that scene's playing that way, then oh, then it's going to start, it's, it's a living, growing thing. And so every night you are reconsidering the entire movie. Well, if she would, boy, if she was tougher in that than I thought she was going to be. And, well, if that's the way, oh my God, is it going to go that way? How do I want it to go now? So you've got to keep your eyes open because the characters are now, the characters are now determining where your movie is going, not you. Sounds like then, plan but be open. Plan but be open. Okay. Yes, have yes, have a good plan. Have a strong plan. Right. Have a definite plan that w you are convinced will work. And then be flexible. Be willing to throw it out. Or be willing to adapt it, adjust it. Right. So how do you work with directors who get so married to that plan that they, they just can't deviate from it because that's how they saw it and they know their vision is, you just, just trust me on this one, this is going to work. We've just got to do it this way. Okay, this is a plan in terms of Shooting the film. Shooting the film, but with the scene, with the actors, with yeah. visuals, or what, what aspect? Okay, with, with an actor, and let's say um, the actor who was one way in the audition and one way in the read um, brought a good level of emotion. And then you get them on set, and they've kind of retracted into a little bit of a shell, but it's working in some ways, but not the way you envisioned it. So you can still play the scene, but they're going to be a little more awkward and introverted, not maybe more emotional how you wanted them to be. Okay. Okay, so there's been an adjustment within performance mm -hmm. um, that you may not have asked for, but it's there. Right. And you're saying it's, um, 
it's good, it's interesting, but it's not what you th wanted or th thought you wanted, say, back in rehearsal and pre-production. Right. And now you're shooting. Now you're right? shooting. And so what do you do? What do you do? Because even though, yeah, it looks good and I like it, and other people, or the other actors are feeding off the energy, I still, it's got to be this one way. Okay. The first thing is the idea, it's got to be this one way is a trap. Watch out for that. Because I can tell you, tell you right now, as a director, to a director, this idea of while you're shooting, knowing precisely what you want, and you're going for that, is a problem. Not a problem going for it, but it's a problem believing that if you have that, then you're fine. Because I know exactly when you'll know what you want from that character and that scene. And that's in post-production. In post-production, when you're editing that scene together, and this has happened many, many times, I've seen it way too many times, you edit the scene together and you go, okay, it looks good, it looks good, got it. Then you put the whole movie together and now that scene isn't looking so good anymore because it's part of a stream. A movie is not a bunch of scenes linked together. It's a stream. It's a constant movement. It's a constant movement of characters. And now they suddenly these two characters hitting that scene and something is off. Now maybe it's too restrained. Maybe it's too enthusiastic. Maybe it's some, there's something that's tipping, something's wrong. Now, the, so the big question, now we're in post-production. That scene isn't quite working. What options do you have? to fix the scene. Because I can tell you, and again, I've seen this many times, at that moment you go, I know what I need, but I don't have it. We didn't shoot it that way. We didn't shoot it where she's <coughs> more restrained. We didn't shoot it where he's more adamant. We didn't shoot it where um, the, the emotions ha has more conflict. We didn't shoot it with more sense of sympathy or empathy or whatever. Whatever you think you need. If we had that, we'd be great. So the question really becomes, why didn't you shoot that? The reason you didn't shoot that is because you didn't think that's what you needed. Even if someone had suggested, even if I had been on the set with a director, and this has happened a few times, and I said, are you sure you don't want to do one more where she's a little more restrained, or one more where she's, where she's a little bit more out of control, or try one with a slight difference? No, 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 I'm, I'm fine. As soon as I hear I'm fine, I just can feel that chills like, oh, because you don't know. Now, many directors I've told them, you don't know. So a lot of the directors I work with, will, if I'm with them, I say, you sure you want to do that? They said, it'll take less time to shoot that than it would be to argue it. <laughs> so I say, shoot it. Now, this comes back to Robert Altman. Okay, Robert Altman, who I knew for a while. And when I was in New York, he was um, directing a play directing a play that my wife at the time was in called Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. Now Robert Altman is a, obviously a master film director, independent film director, who had done the theater before. In fact, he had done another play with another friend of mine, Frank South, he had done a play of his. So he knew about theater, but now he's doing a big Broadway show. And because my wife was in it, I was allowed to come in and sit in on rehearsals. And I was there one time. Now, Robert Altman has like a six-week rehearsal period, which is typical. And it was about two, it was about halfway through it, and he had the whole play staged. He had tried a lot of different things, and you could see he was going, I don't know what to do next. I don't know what to do next. Now, I, being the arrogant person that I am and sort of cynical, um, said to him, well, one thing you could do is Try all the things you, th you know won't work. And he says, oh, that's great. Let's okay. So he started doing the craziest things. Let's try it this way. Now, this is theater. And being my background, being theater, this is what we do in theater. We try things that don't work. We try things that seem ridiculous way outside the box. And he started playing with it. And the actors loved it and all that. <coughs> but the important thing is what he said later. He said to me, he says, I get it. The rehearsal process in theater is the same as the editing process in film. Now, when he said that at first, I didn't quite get it, but I thought about it, and I went, wait a minute, he's right. 
The rehearsal process in theater is a process of trial and error, experimentation. Let's try this. Doesn't work. Let's try that. Oh, that works. Let's keep that. Let's. And even in terms of script, you can be changing things in theater. You can keep changing. So it's a trial and error period leading up to opening night. And eventually you narrow it down to this, we're going to play it this way. And even the day before you open, you can be trying things. The editing process is a similar process. It's trial and error. Let's cut it together this way. Let's try it this way. Let's try it with this moment. Let's try it cutting the scene this way. But the thing is, the difference between theater and film, in post-production and film, if you don't have the material you need to go through a trial and error process, you can't do it. You look at that actress's performance and you say, I've got four takes of her doing it. Every time she did it, she did it pretty much the same way. That's all I've got. So you don't have the choice. My recommendation to every director I work with, and this is the way I shoot stuff, my job in po not post-production, my job in production is to create the range of material from which I will choose later. I don't have the way to do it. I have a range. No, I have in my mind. I know what I want, but I also want a range of material way beyond that. Sometimes the most ridiculous things. And the actors know that. In fact, I tell the actors, I don't know how I want this to play. I don't even know how I want the entire movie to play. And they say, you don't? I said, no. So we're going to keep experimenting. We're going to shoot a lot of rehearsals. We're going to shoot a lot. And the actors relax. They go, oh, the pressure is off. I'm not trying to hit a perfect performance because Mark doesn't know what it is. I said, no, I don't know what it is. I'll tell you what I think it could be. I could be wrong. So even this last thing I shot just a few weeks ago, and I said to the actors, and I always do this, I said, okay, let's do a few more just for you. Be outrageous. I asked the act, the actors, be outrageous. Go way outside the box, as far as you want. And we shoot that, and some of that stuff is amazing. And we use it. Had no idea. This is staying open, but it's going into post-production with a, this range of material out of which myself and the editor can start to create the scene. As you know, in a film, the scene is not created when you're shooting it. The scene is created in post-production, and we will create a scene that never happened. It never happened. That three-minute scene never was played that way. On film it is, but that, that three minutes is made up of about seven or eight different performances. So there is no perfect performance. And that scene is cut in relationship to the rest of the movie. And I need that range of material in order to do that. It almost sounds like a, a new director would have more of that mindset where I have to get it specifically this way, but then ones that have sat in an editing bay and have seen and have been in the position yeah. of, I don't have any filler and I can't change it around. Yes, and this is why some of the best directors we have, and you just recently, when we were off camera, you mentioned, who do you mention? Sidney Lumet. Oh, right, uh, Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. Cassavetes, Cassavetes and uh, Berkman. Mm -hmm. Who all worked in theater. Oh. Now, directors who've worked in theater understand this process absolutely because they say, well, that's my process. My process is rehearsal, trial and error, rehearsal, trial and error, not trying to nail something down before I'm done. It's all trial and error. <coughs> so the director's understanding that process, and <coughs> this is why when I consult with directors, I take them through what we call a workshopping process. I take them through with their film this trial and error process even before pre-production with actors so they can start to see how this can work. They can see the range of possibilities and get out of their mind, getting back to your question, <coughs> releasing from their mind <coughs> the feeling that, <coughs> excuse me, releasing from their mind the feeling or the belief that they know how the movie should be played. That's not important. In fact, that's a trap. I know how the scene should be played. That's a trap. Better way to think about a scene is, <clears throat> I know how I want this scene to hit me emotionally. I know that. Which goes back to the script wash. I know how I want to be hit by this scene. My, I have no idea how I'm going to get there. And it's going to be trial and error right up into the last edit. Until I can look at it and go, that's it. It's doing it. It's doing it. It's doing it to me. 
the scene that I was just talking about that I recently shot, a shift in the music that the editor came up with, a slight shift that he did. He did a mir miraculous thing. And this was a scene that I was directing and I was directing it for, in front of a group of directors that I was talking about earlier that came from overseas for this workshop, demonstrating all these techniques. But the scene in the editing was shifted dramatically. This is really interesting in terms of the trial and error. As the editor was cutting it together, he picked a piece of music he thought would be interesting on the scene. I liked it. We changed the edit. We changed the edit. Now that piece of music didn't fit anymore and he took it out. And Elsha and I went, oh no, we want to keep that in. But, we, but there was another piece of music we wanted to come right after. Two different pieces of music by the same composer, same artist. Well, they don't fit together at all. And we kept, can't we keep that one in and put that one in? And he goes, no, no, you can't. It won't work. But he, as an editor, knew that we wanted to do that. And by actually manipulating the second piece of the music, changing the key that it was in, he made a net fit together and suddenly the scene started working again. Now that's trial and error. That's the editing process. Now that was just a piece of music. It has nothing to do with the performances. <clears throat> but suddenly it underlined what was going on in the performances. And so you have to keep your mind open to all these possibilities constantly. One of my favorite quotes is from uh, Sidney Pollack, who I know a little bit. <clears throat> when he said, he said, Making movies is great. I love the process of making movies. He says, there's only one problem. Now you have to understand Sidney came from theater too and, and worked with Sanford Meisner and all that. <coughs> he says, there's only one problem with movie making. Eventually, you have to show it to somebody. Which really means eventually you have to stop the process of making the movie. The process of making the movie is great, but when you have to lock things down and go, that's it. That's the hard part. That's the most painful part. Mark, in your book, The Film Director's Bag of Tricks, I think I noticed that you wrote something about uh, director Ilya Kazan and how mm -hmm. he would get to know actors and take them out to dinner and mm -hmm. really find out about their story. Mm -hmm. um, have you done that with actors? Do you feel that it's very crucial in terms of um, getting the most from that character uh, you know, and, and, and finding out mm -hmm. what lenses they're seeing Everything. What assumptions? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think. Yeah, getting to know the actors is crucial. In fact, there are a lot of, um, maybe not a lot. <coughs> there are several directors who have even say they don't need to read the actors; they just need to meet them and get to know them <coughs> um, before they cast them. But I think, like what Ilya Kazan would do, and a lot of directors do, again, coming out of theater, these are people who come out of theater, would get to know the actors personally. <coughs> Remember when you're casting and somebody, an actor comes in and reads for you, and let's say he just reads one scene, um, all you know at that moment is how well he can read that scene. That's all you know. Now maybe he did it beautifully, maybe it was very impressive, but you know nothing beyond that. <coughs> and what, one of the things you don't know, you don't know anything about him or her. So if this is someone you're considering casting, yes, get to know them. Some directors I've worked with will even invite three or four actors back for a callback and never read them, but just sit around and talk with them and discuss things and just to get to know the, the personality. You've got to get to know who these people are, how they think. Remember, if you cast them, you're going to spend a long time with them. And you're not spending a long time with them just reading that part. You're spending a long time with that person. And you need to establish a relationship with them, how you can work with them, how they think, what they believe in. And important part of, say, taking an actor to lunch or something, they need to get to know you. You need to be just as open and available and vulnerable to them as you want them to be to you. Because then you're creating a safe space for within which they can work. They need to know that you are there and you are willing to become as vulnerable and as open and as available as they are, as you want them to be. Okay, so let's say you've, you've met this actor, you've had coffee with them, whatever, you've had them read, they're great for the part, then they show up on set and they're not as uh, open, they're a little more closed off. 
Okay, I have a question for you. Sure. Bef between meeting them and casting them, mm -hmm. and then you jump to now they show up on the set. Right. Has there been any rehearsal in between? Sure, there's been rehearsal, and maybe <laughs> maybe during rehearsal they were good, and you felt that they they brought what the character needed, mm -hmm. but then they show up on set and they're closed off. Okay, <coughs> let's assume there's been rehearsal, which we haven't talked about yet, mm -hmm. <coughs> but there's been rehearsal and interrogation, and, I've, and we're in good shape. Now we go to, they show up on the set and they're closed off. <coughs> My job, very, very important job at this point is to under, try to understand why. And I can tell you right now why, generally, why the actor is closed off. Something's wrong. Something they're afraid of. Fear. It's usually a fear-based something is in the way. Now, it can be <coughs> some actors just get closed off because we're shifting into production, like we talked about before. That shift. It could be fear of <coughs> making usually fear of I'm not going to do a job, I'm going to make a mistake, uh, something's going to go wrong, and so they, they will retreat within themselves. This is very normal, it's very natural, it's nothing to be worried about, but it is something to be dealt with. You have to deal with it. And I can tell you the best way to deal with it is to actually ignore it, because if you start talking about it, you can only very possibly make it worse. What are you afraid of? Oh, it's, it's just a camera. It's, you know, you, you're talking about the fear and it'll just get bigger. That's all you have to do. The best way to, to deal with it is ignore it, honor it, but ignore it, and go into the interrogation process. If I start shifting with that actor and start talking to the character, do you know what happens to that fear? It goes into the background with the actor. As I allow the actor to shift into the background and pull the character into the foreground, okay? The fear that the actor has goes with the actor. It doesn't stay with the character. The actor will probably feel very comfortable just being the character. You don't want the actor to drag that fear or whatever the concern is into the character. That's what you have to avoid. And through the interrogation process, you can actually stop it before that happens. You know, you had talked in your video about um, sometimes when you push up against something for so long, it becomes this obstacle that you can't defeat mm -hmm. after a while. And, and maybe I'm, I'm butchering what you said, but I find that f a fascinating concept. So it, it, can you talk about how that happens in, in, in just a, well, a, a metaphorical sense? Well, yeah, I mean, <coughs> yeah, in that video talking about pushing up against an obstacle, mm -hmm. something that's resisting you, and I believe what you're referring to is I'm talking about a character doing that, not so much an actor or a director, but a character doing that, which is pretty much the same thing as an actor or director. And that what we do, what all of us will do if we're pushing up against something and there seems to be no way to get around it and we can't make any progress, we will do what I call an adjustment. We will shift from where we are and try to pursue the same objective from a different angle. Which is, in other words, change our attitude, change our modus operandi, change our plans, right? Somebody wants to be an actor, or he wants somebody, I can't get any work, can't get any work. I say, okay, I'll move to New York. There's an adjustment. It may or may not work. I don't know. In other words, we will make an adjustment to get around it. Now, this discussion we're having now came out of actors dealing with fears or being a problem. And if you're pushing up against an actor and they're a problem, and you have a problem with an actor and they're being resistant or being with withholding or whatever, if you keep pushing up against that problem, and keep pushing, it'll probably get stronger. It's, the thing is, make a shift. Interrogation is one way to make a shift. <coughs> Going for a walk with the actor may be the shift. Say, let's, let's get out, let's get out of here, let's get out the set. Aren't we supposed to be shooting? Yeah, but I'm the director. Guess what? I, we, everybody does what I want to do. I've done this. Let's go for a walk. Where are we going? I don't know. You want to get a cup of coffee? And suddenly they're going, oh, okay, that's a shift. Let's approach this in a different way. Take the pressure off. Can you do something differently rather than just pushing against it? Mark, let's talk about the interrogation. Let's talk about the beginnings of it, how you began to use it with an actor, how you came up with the idea. The interrogation process that I use with actors is not something I, quote, came up with. Uh, it's something I literally discovered. Um, 
during a very long process. I've been um, working as a director for 30, 40 years, something like that. I lose track of how many years. <coughs> and it's one of those things that I look back over my career and I realize what I've been doing. I didn't realize this until maybe 10 years ago, what I've been doing. I, I've been constantly in a process of experimentation in directing, experimentation working with actors, an experimentation that has had at the core a very simple question, there must be a better way to do this. There's got to be another way. There are a lot of great ways of doing this. Now, when you think about what we're doing, which we talked about before, we're all storytellers. Directors, writers, and actors are all storytellers. And our goal, as I see it, is to tell stories as honestly, truthfully, openly, and authentically as possible. And at the center of these stories are characters. So we want characters to be honest, truthful, and authentic characters. Not that the character is always telling the truth, I don't mean that, but we're presenting the character as honestly as we can. And through the years, going way back, now I'm going back to Stanislavski, which is the early 1900s, he caused a great shift in this process of acting, which you probably know about from, quote, presentational acting. There was a book I had once which I wish I could find. I think I've lost it. It was actually a book that was written in the, I think, late 1800s that for actors showing all the positions that an actor could hold to portray or relate an emotion to the audience. And if you look at the early films, the films were certainly the ones before sound, you can see this, you know, what this meant, right? and these looks. In other words, and this book was a wonderful book because it showed all these, it says, this is how you do it. This is how you act. This is how you portray this. And so that's presentational acting. And what Stanislavski was doing in the early 1900s, he asked a very simple question, profound question. He was struggling with the fact that in the Moscow Art Theater, they'd give a performance, or he'd give a performance, or the actors he's working with would give a performance, and it would be powerful. And the next night, it wouldn't be. There was no consistency. Sometimes it would be, uh, feel authentic and other times it would feel really false and fake. <clears throat> and so he was asking, how can we stay closer to those powerful performances that feel real? Or even he as an actor, when I feel like I'm really connected with the character. So he did this very significant thing. He shifted at that time, it's a, it's a seismic shift. Let's take our mind off of acting and let's look at the character. And let's talk about the character, what the character wants, what the character needs, what's in the way of the character getting what he wants, how he's trying to get what he wants. Let's look at what the character is doing and stop thinking about what I am doing as an actor or what the other actors are doing as actors or how we think we should portray this. Let's try to understand the character. And that was the big shift. Stanislavski, shifting to the character. Now this led to, as you know, the group theater and Harold Klerman, Bobby Lewis, Stella Adler, Strasberg, Sanford Meisner, all the people from the group theater who studied, a lot of them studied with Stanislavski, went and learned from him. And this changed the way theater was done in this country, the way acting was done in this country. It became more realistic. Eventually became known as method acting. <coughs> but it was a focus to let's present real life, real behavior rather than presentational behavior or acting. And by acting I mean pretending, pretending to be sad, to pretending to be angry. Can we actually do performances where that genuine emotion is, is exhibited and felt within the actor? And that's what happened. And then Strasberg and Strasberg and Ilya Kazan, Ilya Kazan, I don't know if you know, he's the one that created the actor's studio and eventually turned it over to Strasberg, who turned it into what he's turned into, that actor studio. And then Sanford Meisner, who was also a member of the, the group theater, felt, he felt, there's a better way. Now he split off from that group. Strasberg went <coughs> um, ahead and formed and reinforced the method acting. The method acting, which is the actor trying to stimulate those emotions from within himself. 
based on his own life history, sense memory, experiences, and seeing can I generate those f genuine feelings. <coughs> Meisner said, and that's not what the fo primary focus should be. Meisner said the focus needs to be on the other character, <coughs> on the event, what is actually happening in the moment. So that, so that was a split that happened in the group theater. And so, so now we have the method for technique or method, and then we have the Meisner technique, which are different, but they actually complement each other. Now, <coughs> I'm coming through theater at the same time. I actually studied, I'm very happy to say this, with some of these people. I studied with Harold Clerman, Bobby Lewis, Stella Adler, a lot of people from the group theater. I did not study with Sanford Meisner. I wish I had, but I've studied a lot of his work, and there's a great documentary out there by Sidney Pollack on the Meisner tech. He followed Sanford Meisner for a whole month through a whole class. And so I've studied that. So my pursuit was similar to theirs. There's got to be another way. <coughs> Not dismissing any of this, but seeing these as stepping stones, which I've done in, in my work. So I've studied all this and I keep experimenting. And it was about 10, 8, 10 years ago, something hit me which was rather startling to me, which was, and I was actually in Amsterdam uh, teaching at the Binger Institute at the time, and that actors are dealing always, always, their pursuit is uh, to try to become the character. The director is helping, everybody's helping, trying to get the actor to become the character. And the actor is dealing with certain obstacles, there enormous obstacles in that path. But what hit me at one point was one of the biggest obstacles for the actor, any actor to be able to do that, was the actor themselves. And ironically, the intent to become a character gets in the way of becoming the character. The intention, the hard work of becoming the character will get in the way. How can you become a character? when all you're thinking about is becoming the character. That is not what the character is thinking about. That was really bizarre when I started to play with this idea when in, in Amsterdam I said, and I didn't really know, this is why I'm saying I discovered it, I didn't really know what I was saying. I said to the group of directors, now these are working directors that have made so many films, they're all professional directors, and this whole workshop was on working with actors. And I said to one of the directors, I tell you what, to, here's what you need to do. You need to stop directing the actor. He goes, what? Well, this is the, what the whole workshop is about. I said, stop it. Stop directing the actor. Direct the character. And he looked at me. And to tell you the truth, Karen, at that moment, I wasn't quite sure what I had said. And it's one of those moments in my teaching career, one of those wonderful moments where I say something. And I have no idea what it means, but I have a feeling it's good. <laughs> I have a feeling there's something there. And so the, I remember the director said, well, show me what you mean. So I said, I, okay. And I, I turned to the actor and I stopped. I didn't talk to the actor. I talked to her character. And I'm talking to her character and I'm starting asking the character questions. And, all. and this is where the interrogation started. I started asking and what I'm seeing is suddenly this character start to emerge. This character is starting to emerge because I'm questioning the character. I'm not saying to the actor, this is what I want you to do. I'm not questioning the character about what she thinks about the, um, her character. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just talking to the character and saying, who are you? What are you doing? What are you doing? Why do you want this from the... And starting to probe inside the... And what happened was this character emerged. We all sat there and went, oh my God, this is amazing. Now the rest of the workshop went that way, went shifted dramatically still with me not quite sure what I had done, but feeling this, I'm on to something here. And it was during that workshop that the word interrogation came up because someone said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm interrogating. So that's where the world, that's where it became called the interrogation process. It wasn't until much later I kept doing this. I kept experimenting as I have my whole life, experimenting with everything that I kept <clears throat> using this technique, teaching this technique, even though I didn't quite understand it, and starting to deconstruct and, and spent a long time, which as I mentioned to you before, 
um, and Elsha and I have been doing this, still deconstructing it, still trying to figure out why it works and how it works. And we're deeper and deeper in this to understand what this process is. And what became clear to me after a while, not immediately, was that I'm talking to a character. Now I'm asking a character, very simple but very profound, and um, questions, pushing the character to answer questions. After that experience in, in Amsterdam, I kept exploring what I had stumbled upon. I, and I literally mean I feel like I stumbled upon something in many forms. And there was one time I was working on, I think it was here in Los Angeles, and I started to ask myself, okay, I'm talking to an actor, I'm sorry, I'm talking to a character, and I'm questioning the character, I'm interrogating the character, I'm pushing the character, and the character is responding, maybe resisting me, but is not refusing this engagement. And I know that this makes no sense at all. It's totally illogical. First of all, as we've talked about before, the character, the character does not know that she's in a movie, does not, is, is not in a movie. So I'm not, I can't ask questions about movie making, line, script, I, but I can ask questions about who they are, what they want, what they're doing, anything I want. But the question came to my mind, who is she talking to? Who am I? Because if she's not a character in a movie, if she's not participating in a movie, but she's just herself, she doesn't have a director, who am I? And then it became clear to me, I am not a character that she's responding to. Who I am, I am the voices in her head, what I call the committee. The committee is the collection of voices that we all have. Each of us has all these voices in our head that we would have debates with and discussions, that have opinions and attitudes. And that what I am doing is I am giving voice to the committee in the character's head, not the actor's head, the character's head. In fact, I am creating a character by creating the character's committee and allowing the character to respond to her own committee. And her response, every response, creates the character. So I'm creating a character from deep, deep inside the character, actually without the help of the actor. The actor's attitude or feelings or opinions about the character are fine, but they, as many actors have told me, there's no room for that. The character is working so hard to <coughs> manage her way through this interrogation. There's no room for the actor's imagination or creativity to come in, although I do believe unconsciously it is working. But the character is being formed from inside the character to the point where the character can take over completely. So it's almost like this character has a mini court trial going on and they're on the witness stand yes. and they've got this trial attorney that's just grilling them. Yes. But it's really their own voices, their own it's their vo from yes. the past, yeah. whatever, what, their own thoughts, that's just, just relentless. Yeah. And, and so does it break them down? Does it cause them to, you know, you, you've seen films where someone will have a meltdown on the witness stand. Is it almost like that? They're having this mini meltdown inside themselves. As, as, as the character? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <coughs> I mean, yeah, there have been breakdowns. There have been some extraordinary things that have happened, um, even to the point where it has frightened other people in the room uh, with the power of what's happening, which I could tell you about one, which is interesting where one character, I drove a, a character to the point of suicide, that she was ready to kill herself, wow. and where the other people in the room kept begging me to stop because they were so frightened what she was going to do. So finally I did stop, and uh, the actress, his name was Kathy, and I was talking to the character, I don't remember the character's name, uh, so they wanted me to stop. So I, and the way to stop is just to address the actor by her real name. And I said, Kathy, okay, we're going to stop. And she said, oh, okay, why? Why? I said, well, there are people in the room are scared. And I said, are you okay, Kathy? She says, I'm fine. Why do we stop? In other words, <coughs> the separation between character and actor is really profound that the character can be going through the most extraordinary emotional experiences, and the actor is fine. The actor is protected from that. 
the actor is experiencing it, obviously, because it's happening within the actor. But once it stops, it's they're done. They're over. So, it, so it, 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 it's running very deep inside the character. And getting back to a moment about Stanislavski and all of that, and, and going back to <coughs> the whole history and the, the group theater and Strasbourg and Meisner and all that, the way I see the work that they were doing that I feel I'm totally in line with is they were always looking for how can we get closer to the truth of the character? How can we stop pretending, stop manufacturing? I think this is what the method has done. This is what uh, Stanislavski was going after. This is what the Meisner te technique has done. This is what a lot of other teachers, whether it's Kwiatkowski or Viola Spolin, they're all moving towards authenticity. And what I feel that I'm doing here is as I've found yet an extension of what they're doing. I feel like I've actually, going all the way back to Stanislavski, I've shifted back to the character again. Some of my problems with the, um, the method and Stanislaw, um, Strasberg, even though I'm a, I am a member of the actor studio, both here and in New York, invited. I was invited by Harold Clerman, which is cool. And here I was invited by Mark Rydell. I'm a member there, <coughs> and I see the work they're doing. My problem is there's a little too much focus on acting and how the actor is behaving. And what I've done is I said, let's shift to the character. Let's take your mind off of the acting. Because if, you, if you're always thinking about the acting while you're trying to be the character, there's no room for the character's mind. I want to stimulate the character's mind. The ir ironic thing about this technique is, as opposed to probably all other ways of approaching acting, I think, this technique, the interrogation technique, is director dependent or other dependent. The actor cannot do it by themselves. Because you cannot sit there and think, okay, I'm going to shut down my actor's mind and open up my character's mind. As soon as you think that, the actor's mind is working. It has a job. Shut it. You can't shut your brain down. The interrogation process, because it's so powerful and overwhelming, forces the actor's mind to drift into the background, forces the character's mind and personality to emerge. So it needs another person, not necessarily the director, but it's good if it's the director. It needs another person for that, that to happen. So I feel like I'm actually right in line with where Stanislavski was. Like, let's shift off of the actor back to the character. I've just taken it a few steps further into a very powerful, and it's very fast. It can happen in a matter of minutes, which you've seen. I do humbly believe that what I've done and what I'm doing, because this is a constant process, is I'm continuing the work that started with Stanislavski and Strasberg and Meisner and Viola Spolin and Gwatowski, a lot of these um, legendary explorers of the acting process, and sh continually to shift the focus back to the character to relinquish from the actor the responsibility of creating or pretending to be something and allow the, the actor to experience the character that actually lives within them. Now, as I said before, this, the challenging part of this process is it takes two people, a director and an actor, or an actor and somebody else. The actor cannot just do it by themselves. It's an engagement. Now, the beauty of that is it's an engagement. It is part of the acting process where the actor says, I'll be the character, you interrogate me. And suddenly they're in an improvisation, which they understand. It's interesting. This takes pressure off of the actor. The actor doesn't have to have any answers at all. Many times I've worked with an actor and we've been talking about a character and we go, I don't know, does she think this, does she think that? Oh, I don't know. I say, well, let's ask the character. They go, great. And then we go in an interrogation. It may only take 30 seconds, and bam, the answer is out. We got it. Great. So the, we allow the actor to do what they want to do, which is act, is to be the character. An example <coughs> of this is a couple of years ago, I directed a play. I direct a lot of theater, and I direct film and television. I direct a play, 11 actors. Now, 11 actors, we went through a 10-week rehearsal process this way, using interrogation. At first, the interrogation was in the casting process, which is a startling thing to watch and was startling for the actors to get up there and read 
for a part and the first thing I do is I start interrogating the character. There is no preparation, there's no warning. And you watch the actors and within a second the actor will go right back into the character happily. They don't want to be questioned, they don't want to be told what to do, they want to be the character. And then I'm, I base my casting process on the characters that are revealed inside the actor more than their ability to read or to perform because I'm looking for authenticity. Now I've cast 11 people this way, 10 week rehearsal process and during that process I am teaching these actors how to interrogate. Besides interrogating them as the characters, I'm teaching them how to interrogate each other because the danger is, or not the danger, the challenge is. In theater they're going to do the play every night and one thing that's once you see the interrogation process, the ironic thing is actors are very good at it because it requires improvisation. It requires, as I said before, playing the committee, playing multiple characters. And so if I was interrogating you, I could shift from um, an ally to a nemesis to a mother figure. In other words, I have to be able to do this. So actors are very good at it, so I'm teaching these actors how to do this because it's a play and I have a problem here. These actors have to do this play every night. In a film, I can interrogate an actor right before a performance, get him in exactly the state of mind I wanted to be in them and send him in the scene and film it. I'm done. I can't do that in a play. Every night it's a different performance. So I'm teaching these actors how to interrogate each other. As the play is running, and this was the plan, the actually the event that was going on backstage was far more fascinating than what was going on on stage and I rarely saw it because backstage the actors are interrogating each other before every entrance. I have an entrance in five minutes, can you interrogate me? They're doing that backstage so that the actor can come on on stage fully in character. Not to have to be standing there waiting for the cue line to come out and try to hit an emotional state that they know they're supposed to be in. They're already in it because of the interrogation that's going on backstage. In fact, there was one Ian, one of the actors who did a lot of interrogation backstage, would come to me after a performance. You know, how was Corrine's entrance? Well, it was great, great. I tried something new. He's talking about what he was doing backstage to send her on and wanted to know from me how it worked. So there was this. Now, so we had a process there with these 11 actors. They were working together like a team, helping each other get into character, deep into character before every entrance. The play, by the way, was fantastic. Um, even though the backstage, I heard, was really phenomenal, but I never got to see it. I get to hear about it. So you're saying that the interrogation process works when there's an other person interrogating them? Yes. So let's take something where slightly different scenario, maybe I'm, I'm kind of making a different way around it in that let's take a movie like The Revenant and let's take Hugh Glass's character before the bear attack. So he's okay. alone in the forest. How are you interrogating Hugh Glass to be, you know, stumbling upon the bear or encountering him? How are you getting him ready for that? Okay. Uh, first, I'm just getting back to what you said at the beginning, interrogating involves someone else. Now the interrogation process is usually between someone who's not in the scene and the person who's in the scene. So right. whether there's one person in the scene or 12 people oh, in the scene okay. makes no difference. Doesn't matter? Okay. Yeah, that each actor needs that other person and usually someone who's not in the scene. Got it. Okay. So, <laughs> but getting to and how do you interrogate someone to play a scene like Hugh Glass's scene where he's going through the forest, the woods, and then he's attacked by a bear. One thing you've got to be very clear about. No, the interrogation is um, pretty simple yet profound for a moment like that. But first of all, you've got to remember in any scene, the character that you're interrogating does not know what's coming up in the scene. This is a problem between the character and actor. The actor knows. Leonardo DiCaprio, he knows exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be a bear and he's going to have to fight it off. Got it. The character doesn't know that. And then this is the power of interrogation. I've got to get his mind back into the character's mind and then away from the actor's mind. The, what the actor knows, this is a little detour, what the actor knows, what's coming up in the scene, the lines I have to say, what I have to do, that's all there, but it's in the background, okay? It's not driving everything because it can't drive everything because it is not known by the character. 
I will trust that it'll always be there. I will trust that the actors will always say the lines. They'll follow the stage and they'll do the mechanics. No problem. So it's not about the mechanics I'm worried about. What I'm worried about is the mindset of the character. So in interrogating Hugh Glass before the bear, I have to know, and so does Hugh Glass have to know, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? Where are you going? In the, and what are you expecting? Now in the interrogation, I could say, okay, I could be talking to him. Where are you going? Okay, you're going to go. You're going to get that. You're going to. Let's let's say he's looking for food. I'm just making this up because I, I don't recall what he was doing. He's just moving, but he knows what Hugh Glass knows what he's doing. Even if we look at the scene, we're not sure what he knows, what he's doing, and I through the interrogation, I am going to plant in his mind or inject or question, and we're, we're going to establish through me, between me and Hugh Glass, what he's doing, what he's looking for, right? Now, through that interrogation, I could also, I could start to insinuate potential danger. You know, you're all alone. You're all alone out here. I mean, what if something happens? Now, he knows as the actor, I'm setting the character up for what the environment or what's going on, and actually setting the character up for the scene. The actor knows that because there's a bear coming. Hugh Glass, is just saying, yeah, I know it's dangerous, but I'm fine. You got your rifle? I'm a guy. I got my rifle. I'm fine. I said, you sure? Could you handle some, something? What if an elk cub? No, I'm, now I'm, I want to get him into a mindset, a specific mindset of my choice. The mindset could be, I'm fine. I'm in no danger at all. That's one mindset. Another mindset is, I know I'm out here alone and I shouldn't be and this is the stupidest thing you should ever do. That's a different mindset. Where do I want to take him? What mindset do I want to put him in? And I can set up that mindset and then the beauty of interrogation is you work with the character, you're interrogating the character and you set up a mindset, a belief system, an attitude just before the scene. A lot of actors will talk about that moment before the scene. Where, what are they thinking about just before the scene? With interrogation, I can create that, anything I want. And then what I do, which I love, is that I send them into the scene, naive. An actor will go into the scene with a plan. This is disastrous. Because the actor, when's the last time you went into a, a three minute moment in your life with a plan, knowing what you were gonna say and what you were gonna do and how you were gonna react? We don't do that. That's not authentic. That's acting. My job is to send the character into a scene naive, having no idea what's going to come on. Because I want the genuine, authentic reactions to the events that happen, to the other lines that are said, to the attack of the bear, to the realization that he's been stupid, whatever. I want it to happen authentically. I don't want him to plan it. The actor will try to plan it. The character can't plan it. So if I get him in the, the mind of the character believing something totally different than what's going to happen, then he will react to every single moment authentically. And it will probably surprise him. It will probably surprise me. The guarantees I can make to every director is if you work this way and you send a character into a scene naive, without a plan, knowing that, yes, the actor will say the right lines and do the blocking and do all that, but without a plan for the emotional journey he's going to go through or how he's going to react to anything, no plan. And guarantee, number one, the actor will not know what he's going to do at all. Certainly the character doesn't know because the character is just going through it. Actor one, you, the director, will not know what he's going to do, but everything he does will be authentic. And that's what we're going for. And then you get to choose in post-production, as we talked about before, which moment you want. And then when you do take two, you set them up slightly differently, a different mindset. Maybe a more cautious mindset this time for Hugh Glass. Maybe a mindset of deriding himself. How stupid, what are you doing out here? Okay, that he'll try to convince himself he's gonna be okay and he shouldn't be out there. He will react differently then. Now, if you do it three or four takes like that and he reacts differently and you've shot them all, you realize the range of material you've got that you, and it's all authentic. You can build the most beautiful scene possible. 
Do you think that a director can be an effective director if they themselves have never taken acting classes or just maybe one or two little one-day workshops? Do you think they really need to dive into taking a full semester or several, you know, a year of, of acting classes to really know what it's like to be the person that they're directing? Again, you've done 12 questions. Oh, no! <laughs> no. I, in my mind, I heard one. So. Oh, no, there's a lot. First of all, the first thing you said, I'll go back to the first, can they be an effective director without it? Yeah. It's really where you started, or with very, absolutely they can be. Oh, they can, okay. It doesn't mean you have to have um, studied acting or been an actor. You don't have to. No, oh, okay. You, you know, there are a lot of directors who are very good and very effective without it. Now, that's because of who they are. And I don't know what all their training background and history um, is. <coughs> but looking at the other side, if you want to be the best director you could ever be, then take an acting class and writing. We talked about writing earlier. Oh, okay. But take an acting class. And take an acting class with other actors. Not an acting class where it's just two or three directors trying to learn how to act because that, that they'll, that you'll all hold each other down. But if you get into an acting class with some actors, some really good actors, and so you can experience <coughs> what it's like to go through the process. You can experience what it's like to get a script and start to break down a scene. You can experience what it's like to do the homework. You can experience what it's like to get up there with another actor who you don't know what they're going to do <coughs> and you're trying to engage with them and you're trying to engage with the, the power of the scene you're trying to engage with your character and you can do this week after week after week after week now you're getting to experience what it's like to be an actor now the important thing here is not how good an actor you are you could be the world's worst actor doesn't matter <clears throat> it's the experience it's getting inside the shoes of the actor going through that so you understand this is what they have to go through. This is the challenges they face. Your whole perception of talking to them and what you're asking them to do will change because you'll know you can't just ask them to be angrier. That doesn't work. You can't ask them to be more sympathetic or show you a little more vulnerability because it doesn't work. You'll understand from your own experience, not just because I said it or not just because some teacher said it to you, don't do that. You'll understand what works. You'll understand what worked for you. And chances are the things that worked for you, you will start to use those things when you start talking to actors because you know it worked for you. Maybe it'll work with them. Very valuable. Some of our best directors are actors. Some of our best directors come from theater. One thing I want to say about theater directing, since we're on this, theater directing is very different from film directing because in terms of relationships with the actors. <clears throat> because in film directing, I can direct a scene, I can spend a whole day on a scene, and do the range of performances we talked about before, and get that range and get enough, and then I will build a scene that works. In theater, I, have, I don't have that option. I have the option of rehearsing with them and trying a lot of different things, but eventually I have to get those two actors to a point where they can do it all by themselves every night. It's, a, it's much more challenging, way more challenging than film. It's a, different, it's a different challenge, way more challenging in terms of working with actors to get them to be able to repeat something every night or come close to something or stay authentic every single night. So I highly recommend, besides directors taking acting classes, direct theater. And I can say, try it. You'll be amazed at how difficult it is because you have so little control over those actors, so little. So what if an actor thinks, I haven't taken any acting classes, but you know, I don't need to. I, I know human beings. I, I, can, I know more about someone than they know about themselves. It doesn't matter. But you watch them and you're observing the opposite. This is a director, so mm -hmm. the director's doing that. What are you observing in a director that says they don't need acting classes, but you're seeing well, otherwise? Well, as soon as I hear you say that, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Is that three <laughs> questions? I'm sorry. No, no, that, okay. no, that, no, that, that was pretty much one. Uh -huh. um, as soon as I hear you say it, I don't need this. And you know, I, you know, do you know what I hear? Resistance? Arrogance. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> and I also hear fear. Oh. A lot of directors, I mean, are arrogant. Yes, okay. Think I know how to do this. And I'm not saying they're wrong, but the arrogance is doesn't help you. It doesn't help you because it puts up a barrier between you and the actors. <coughs> so a lot of a lot of them feel that they know that. Also, the fear. A lot of actors. I mean, I'm sorry. A lot of directors are afraid of actors. They won't admit it, but in a statement like you just said, I hear it. <coughs> okay, I know how to do what I do. In other words, I don't need to engage with this other human being on a collaborative, vulnerable level. I know what they do. I know how to talk to them. Just, just do this. I, I took psychology. I took this. I, you know, I used to be a this. I used to be a that. You know, I was a life coach. I was a whatever. I know how to do that. And I'm saying, you're telling me that you do not want to engage with them on a one-to-one -one basis in terms of the exploration of something that has absolutely nothing to do with either of you. The thing that it has not that it is that has nothing to do with either of you is a character. You're both working together to create a character. And you think that, you know, so there's there's a fear, there's a resistance. A lot of directors are resistant. They don't a lot of directors don't want to rehearse. Oh no, I don't need to rehearse. I just cast the best people I can and then I'm fine. Don't want to Why? Don't want to rehearse. Why would they not want to? Could be two reasons. One is they have no idea what to do in rehearsal. Now that's a big part of my job is I teach people what to actually how to rehearse. And this is my whole career started many, many years ago at the Directors Guild, me teaching A-list directors how to rehearse. Just the simplest thing in the world. Now it's not the simplest thing in the world, but that's what I was teaching. And my teaching career started way back then. So a lot of directors don't know how what to do. You know, you give them a rehearsal and say, oh, let's read it. And then they talk about it and they talk about the characters. And then, then what? Nothing. So that's one problem is a lot of directors have not been trained how to rehearse. And again, speaking in my career for a moment, this is why I have a career traveling all over the world to film schools, world class film schools, teaching directors how to rehearse because they don't have in the film school someone who knows how to teach directors how to rehearse. So that's one part. And the other part is fear. Auto directors fear being seen as inept, unable, incapable, and this is a big problem. It's a big problem. It's a big problem within the whole film world. Directors are supposed to know everything. You're the director. You should know. Here's an interesting thing. I'm a director's coach and all that, and I, you know, I teach directors. I consult with directors, and many times I coach directors, <coughs> and I'm known as the director's director and all that. Actors in a film, if there's an actor's coach there, that's fine. An actor's coach, fine. Can you imagine a film, they say, hey, who's he? Oh, he's the director's coach. <laughs> what? He need, why does he need a coach? The whole perception, it's not the director's problem, it's a problem with the perception. The director's supposed to have all the answers. So directors, take that in. Embrace that concept. I'm supposed to have all the answers, so I have to say I do have all the answers. So I have to say I know what I'm doing. I don't need help. Many, many years ago, I was, because um, I teach at the Directors Guild, a friend of mine who works there gave me a list of directors, that it was, which is for another seminar, of all the first-time directors, people who came to a first-time directors seminar. I said, Mark, I think you might like to have this list because you're teaching directors. I said, great. I promoted a workshop to that list. It was a big list. And then I had people in my office just doing follow up calls. And one call to one of these directors, I don't know who it was, it doesn't matter. <coughs> and they called, and the director said, Don't call me. Why are you calling me while we're doing this workshop? Don't you understand? He said, I am a member of the Directors Guild. I don't need a directing workshop. Now that is dangerous. See, that, that is him identifying himself as a, as a director, as a member of the Directors Guild, like I've reached a certain level and now I will cut myself off from anything or anything that maybe could help me. Now there's a lot of directors who believe that, a lot of directors who live there and that's what leads to the arrogance. I know what I'm doing. Now I'm fortunate very fortunate as a directing consultant and coach to a lot of directors all over the world because the directors I get to meet, 
number one, who take the workshops, and especially the directors I get to work with who <coughs> ask me to consult on these films, because these are the directors that are open and available and humble enough to know that they can learn more and they can expand their awareness and expand their skills. And the arrogance is not there. The arrogance is not there. And they're, and they're willing to learn. And these are the directors who are they're all doing very, very well now. Let's suppose you're encountering arrogance from someone, and really what you said before was that it was fear, but also to their ego, their pride could be hurt because they're thinking, why do you think I don't know what I'm doing? Which is not really what you're saying. You're just wanting to explore more possibilities and let mm -hmm. them know that you have a class and coaching available. But how can you turn it around and have it so that they don't feel hurt that it's about their abilities? Okay, that's a great question. First of all, we'll get back to that resistance and obstacle thing we talked about before, because if I attack them or approach that whole thing about their arrogance and their putting up a wall against other possibilities, it'll, the wall will get stronger. So I can't do that. Um, but if they say, I know how to work with actors, I know how to, I know all that, usually what I'll say, great, great, let's, let's see how this goes. <laughs> and then, usually what happens, and I've seen this and Elsha's seen this many times, start working with the director and they start working with the interrogation process. Two things happen very quickly. First of all, they realize that the interrogation process is difficult and that's a little intimidating, but they hang in. But then the other thing that they see is what starts to come out of the characters. And they start to see that they are now experiencing something way beyond what they imagined. It probably includes what they thought they wanted, includes aspects of the character they want, but they start to see more. They see such a rich terrain in front of them that suddenly the arrogance drops away. So I rely on the power of what I'm teaching, the techniques of what I'm teaching. If I can t take them through these skills and allow them to experience it, it'll change. The, uh, the, is, uh, there's another similar situation when <clears throat> we get into staging, which we talked about before. And, when, and I'm doing a workshop on staging and the director says, oh, I, I, I know how to stage this thing. I said, great. And they'll stage it and I'll look at it and I will think, no, there's much more you could explore. But rather than tell them, no, you haven't explored enough, you don't get it. I very gently say, okay, that's, that's great. And I'll say to the actor, how do you feel standing there, there in the scene? They'll go, I feel fine, I feel fine. Uh-oh, fine. And, and I'll say to the <laughs> uh, director, okay, she's standing there at the beginning of the scene and how, how do you want her to feel? Well, she should feel really insecure. I say, okay. And I move the actor a little bit to another place. I said, now how do you feel? She says, this is awful. I felt terrible over there. And I turned to the director. I said, is that what you want? He says, yeah. I said, well, you got it. Then he sees, wow, you did that just by moving her. Rather than argue about what he knows and what will work and whatnot, my job is to demonstrate to the directors, here's how this works. You can argue whether you need it or not, you can tell me, what you, but let me show you how it works. 90% of the time, directors are blown away. We had a situation here yesterday with a writer um, this is a slightly different thing, but not on a script. And I interrogated the writer as the main character in the script. And it took, I don't know, Elsha, what was it, about three, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes later, he, first of all, five minutes later, he was in tears as the character. He was shaking and in tears because he had, was, because of what the character was experiencing. And then the writer, what he was experiencing through the character, and he went, oh my God. And he realized he had a whole different movie. He had a whole different scenario. Now he, he, st now he starts to understand the power of what I'm trying to teach him. I could try to explain that to him and go, I, I don't need that. So writers, directors, and actors have to experience these techniques. I can write about it forever. You can see this interview. You can watch this and go, I think I got it. I think I know what he's talking about. You could even watch the DVD that you watch. Go, okay, once you're in there, once you're in the room experiencing it as a writer, as a director, as an actor, any of these techniques, then you will know. It has to be experienced.
Mark Fine. I'm hearing that that is a is a word that doesn't have a good connotation to it. What does fine mean to you? F I N E. When did I use fine? A couple times, and maybe it, I'm projecting my own worldview onto it. But Very possibly. <laughs> <laughs> probably, but I'm okay. hearing that fine is not a good word to describe something. In fact, it means the opposite. But someone's afraid to let someone know that I'm not comfortable with it. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine. I'm oh, fine. oh well, well, I see. When when <laughs> and when someone says I'm fine. Or how how was it that one scene when you yeah fine it's fine. How was the script? Oh yeah, we did some note. You know, so revisions. Let, let me it's ask fine. you. This is not an interview of you, but let me ask you. Sure. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, yes, it is an interview. <laughs> when you hear someone, Karen, say and you say to someone, "How are you doing?" I'm fine. Fine. What do you hear? I hear that things are not good, but they don't want to say it, so they have to have a a good a cover that's just sort of medium yep. instead of oh I'm doing great today yep. or okay. oh man I had a horrible time getting here so but I'm fine they want to close it down yep. they don't want to yeah. talk so anymore. they're closing it. and they're probably mm -hmm. saying what you're probably hearing is yeah I'm I'm fine I'm doing okay and I don't want to talk anymore right which makes you think and me think there's a lot going on there that it's uncomfortable doesn't she doesn't she or he doesn't want to go there so when you say to an actor or someone you work with, how are you doing? Fine. You go, okay, there's something going on. Now, if you keep pressing up against that wall, you're going to get a lot of resistance. Now your job is to, let me see, can I get to it? Can I get, find another way? And this has been my, pretty much my whole career. Find another way to access the truth with that individual or with that character, with that writer, director, actor, or character. How can I get around the barriers that are automatically there because we're human beings and we put them up? We, uh, we protect ourselves. Can I find another way appropriately to get around that and get to the truth? Not only so I can see the truth, but so that the, <coughs> the person who said fine, let's say it's an actor who said I'm fine, my feeling is there's also a part of that person who wants to reveal that. You know, that's, in, that's their committee. That's in the, there's another voice that says, I want to talk about it. And the other voice says, don't <laughs> talk about it. But in other words, there's a little war going on in there that we all experience. So if I can get to the truth and get to, somehow find a way, not only so I can know more, but also so that he or she can have the opportunity to reveal it or even learn something about themselves, quite possibly. So fine to you doesn't mean conversation's over and it's good. It means, hmm, think something's wrong, but I think they would be willing to talk about it if I go around a different way. Yeah. And I don't keep pushing up against, doesn't sound like things are fine. Yeah, yeah. if I do, it doesn't sound like things mm -hmm. are fine, then the wall's going to get thicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it might even be someone says something, and I say something, how are you doing? They're fine, and I go, Okay, we're going to get back to that later. And I may just go off on a whole nother track, but with the intention of getting to what's bothering them. If it's an actor, uh, since we're talking a lot about working with actors, if it's an actor, then my concern will be that whatever's really going on with them is going to get in the way of their work that day. If it's an actor I'm working with that day, how are you doing? Fine. I go, okay, we got this. <laughs> This could get in the way of the work we're doing today. And let's say I'm picking up on resentment or anger or fear. And that, these are very general. And, and then let's say it's act, let's say it's Ian, who's an actor I've worked with a lot, and I get this fine. I go, okay, there's a lot of that going on. Now, as we're working on the scene, I haven't addressed it at all. As we're working on a scene, and I start interrogating his character. Do you know where I'll go? Anger, resentment, fear. As the character, I will allow Ian to express whatever's going on through the character. And this is when it actually becomes, in a way, a little therapeutic, and which is another whole topic because there are therapists who have been looking at what I'm doing and wondering if, if, if it's another form of therapy, which I will address right now. It's not. It's not a form of therapy because I've had a lot of people ask me about this along with the hypnosis question. Mm. But t the interrogation is not a form of therapy. A therapy generally is intended to help 
the patient, the person, the individual, sort of smooth out the edges, get through life in a much more comfortable way, and deal with whatever problems he's dealing with. Interrogation is absolutely the opposite. Interrogation creates chaos. I create chaos inside the character so <coughs> that the actor, as the character, has to struggle with I want them to struggle. I don't want to smooth it out. I want the actor to experience the struggle that's going on inside the characters. So it's the, it's the opposite of therapy. Coming back to your question about the fine, someone saying fine, I think we all hear that there's a hidden feelings, emotions, or truth behind that. And our job as directors is to honor that, respect it, but not forget it. And if we can allow the actors, especially, a way to release that through the characters, even if, even if it's inappropriate for the character at the time, that may be a gift to the actor. Top three movies every actor should watch and oh which God. performance they should study. That's like, in terms of acting. Doesn't mean story, but whether it's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, whether it's network, I mean, just in terms of acting and performances. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. Top movies and top performances are two different categories. Okay, top performances. Let me, let me, Top yeah. performances, mm -hmm. Blue Jasmine. Okay, yeah, Blue I Spanish. agree about Big Blanchett, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that was, that was, to me, it was a stunning performance because in terms of the way I work, I think there are certain actors, when I say actors can't do this alone, there are some actors who have these amazing abilities to allow themselves to sink deep into a character. Uh, Kate Blanchett is one of them, and yeah. Blue Jasmine is one of those uh, performances. Almost regardless of what you think of the movie, just watch her work in the, <clears throat> the multifaceted ways because of different time frames that she had to experience that character. Uh, another actor, Daniel Day-Lewis, is similar. If you look, look at his work in Lincoln um, or Gangs of New York and stuff, he's another actor who has found a way of dropping himself deeply into a character. And one, and very quickly, one interview I read about him, not with him, um, an actress who worked with him and asked him at the end of the movie, because she couldn't talk to him during the movie because he was in character all the time, asked him why he spent so much time and so much energy just to get into a character like that. And his answer was, he says, I'm not a good enough actor to do it any other way, which I thought was profound. He sees himself as a very limited actor, and, but he knows what he needs to do to get deep into that character. If you watch Manchester by the Sea, Casey Affleck's performance, mm -hmm. I think, is stunning. Yeah. Regardless of his history, his background, and the problems that he has, watch that performance. Because there's another actor who has dropped so deeply into the nuances of a characters, it's sort of, sort of startling. Meryl Streep will do this frequently. <coughs> Frequently, she's only been nominated twenty times. <laughs> but I mean, there are certain so there are certain actors who you you watch them and they can literally disappear. You feel that the character takes on, and that's 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 what we're looking for. Chameleons. Chameleons in a way, but I I, I see it as a more than a chameleon. Chameleon is more like I will change myself into something. So. Which it is chameleon like, but it is, I will release myself, I will give myself over. To, so I, I, this is my experience. My experience of these actors is they give themselves over and just allow themselves to be in that world with, in a way, ignoring themselves, regardless of what happens to them as an individual, as an actor. They have to be that. It's, it's a total relinquishment to the character. And if someone were to watch, let's say, those performances from those four or five actors that you mentioned, what about turning down the sound and just seeing the body yeah. language, yeah. the reactions, the expressions, the micro-expressions? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Watch them in de detail. Just watch them. Yeah. Turn, turn down and, and watch the movies, which, which Elsha and I do. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have a whole discussion about that. Watch it several times and watch and even stop and look at it and go back and just look at that moment, look at, just look at that reaction and understand that with the, the best performance, that reaction was not planned. That stunning reaction probably was not planned at all. 
It just happened. I remember I was working with an editor who I've worked with in a couple of films of mine. He was showing me a film that I didn't direct, a scene, and there was a stunning moment in that scene. He says, you know, that's the only time she ever did that. And that to me was a key thing. That, you know, to capture those moments that happen. But first of all, the actor has to allow themselves to give that unplanned. Planned performances are death. Unplanned performances are where the gold is. Just go in there and just see what happens. So I'm confused about this. I'm sorry, I just have to ask. So one thing a director does not want in their movie is acting? It doesn't... Yes. I have said this and maybe it upset some people. <coughs> Along with um, one of the most dangerous things on the set is an actor with a plan. But I also say what we don't want in our movie is acting. But by acting, acting, I mean pretending. A manufactured performance. Now it's true, there are actors who have won Academy Awards for what I call acting because you can, it's all so well crafted and um, presented and considered and worked out. I think what we really want to see, what I want to see, I'm not going to be startled by a brilliant, quote, performance. I'm going to be startled by an extraordinary human being who reveals themselves authentically on the screen. When I see something that I wasn't expecting, which I feel genuinely is coming genuinely from that character that was not planned, that was not considered, that was not honed sharply. It was just came out. That's what I want. And that's what I see in like in Blue Jasmine or Manchester by the Sea. I see moments like that that I just find chilling. That's what I want. Now I've seen a lot of performances that are very manufactured. Now there are some films and some filmmakers where that kind of acting is what's required. You watch Wes Anderson's work and stuff like that. That's what's required. That's his style. Nothing wrong with that. That's the style of that work. You could even go back to Kabuki theater. That's a style. <clears throat> what I'm saying, because what I want when I see a movie is I want to feel I'm in the presence of these hu genuine human beings and experiencing them deeply and profoundly and that it's not pretense. It's not calculated. It's genuine. So no acting, please. Which means you have to stop directing. Directors have to stop directing, so actors will stop acting, which means that's why directors switch to interrogation and form a relationship with the character rather than the director telling the actor, here's what I want you to do. The director stimulating the character to go in and find what they do do. Okay, so instead of Casey Affleck's character in Manchester by the Sea, if, if I'm his director saying, you know what, Casey, I want you to look really depressed and I want you to be in this room with no furniture, and instead I'm going up to him and I'm saying, your life is shit. it's fallen apart, and you're here alone in this dingy room. Yes, or even saying to his character, <coughs> I've forgotten the character's name, but saying to Casey as, as, as his character, you're alone in this, didn't you? What, what the hell are you going to do? What the hell are you going to do? Do you realize everybody back at Manchester by the Sea hates you? Do you realize that? And you're going to go back there? What, the, what are you thinking? Now I'm getting him into the, into the chaos of the character. Then I say, okay, let's do the scene. Now we're doing the scene. Now he's totally in the chaos of the character and trying to fight through that chaos while he's trying to fight his way through a scene simultaneously. Sort of like we all do in life every day. We fight through our own chaos while we're trying to get through the daily chaos. He's not thinking about acting. He's thinking about survival. Seriously, how do I get through this? How do I get through this moment? How do I quiet the voices in my head that came through the interrogation? The voices are going mad in his head. And he's trying to quiet those down or sort through those while he's trying to deal with whoever, this lady who needs some plumbing done or whatever it is. And, he's, and that's what he's dealing with. He's dealing with only what the character is dealing with, not with what Casey Affleck is dealing with. Casey Affleck at that moment does not matter. And quite honestly, I can tell you as a director at that moment, if I was directing him, I don't care what Casey Affleck is thinking. I don't care what he's thinking about the character. I don't want him thinking about the character. I only care about the character. I'm there to film the character, 
not to film an acting performance. It's a fine line, but it's a significant line.